All right, guys, jump in here. Type one when you can hear me. There we go. I think the new one started. Waiting for Isaiah Salivar. Let me just add the thumbnail. Type one if you guys can see me. Give me. A, it's going to take a second here. Is this a new one? I think it's a new one, guys. I think it's working here. Let's see. Is everybody here? Check one, two. Type something if you can see me. Let me go. Give me a second, guys. I'm just working something out. All right. We're going to give everybody a second. Again, this is our second stream. We just had to do it after eight hours. But let me just make sure that this is another stream. Yes, it is. Okay, this is a new stream. Our old one is still there. Cool. I just needed to change. I just needed to change the title because it was the same title. YouTube thought it was the same stream. It's no problem. That's actually good because now I know next time if I need to continue a stream, I just title it the same. Facebook. I don't know if you guys are connected. There you go. All right, we're back. Everybody, jump in. Let's give everybody a second. Well, I guess it doesn't matter because I'm gonna just gonna start reading. It's not gonna really matter. But yeah, good. Okay, so we are good. Let's go to. Is our timer still going? Yes, it is. Okay. We're good to go. We got refreshed. Now we should be good for the rest of the night to finish off. Everybody's going to jump in here. Just once you're back, type we're back, type something. Let's do this, guys. Let's go for it here. Are we set up here? Everybody can hear me. I saved everything. Just thinking about all the stuff I have to do. Okay. Looks like that's... Looks like that's fine. Okay. All right, here we go. Second Timothy chapter three. You should know this, Timothy, that in the last days, there'll be very difficult times for people will only love themselves and love their money. They'll be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents and ungrateful. They'll consider nothing sacred. They will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. They'll betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride and love pleasure rather than God. They will act religious, but they will reject the very power that can make them, the, they, they will reject the power that can make them godly. Stay away from people like that. If you're on Discord, make sure you put the new link in Discord, please, some of you. Thank you. Whoever mods, spam it in the general chat. They are kind. They are kind who work. They are the kind who work their way into people's homes and win the confidence of vulnerable women who are burdened with guilt of sin and controlled by various disease. Such women are forever following new teachings, but they are never able to understand the truth. These teachers oppose the truth, just as James and John Bray oppose Moses. They have depraved minds and counterfeit faith, but they won't get away with this for long. Someday, everyone will recognize they are fools, just, just as with Janus and John Bray. But you, Timothy, know that I teach and how I live. You know, oh, I'm sorry, and what purpose in life. So you know my faith, my patience, my love, and my endurance. You know how much persecution and suffering I've endured. You know all about how I was persecuted in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, and the Lord rescued me from all of that. Yes, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution, but evil people and imposters will flourish. They'll deceive others and will themselves be deceived. But you must remain faithful to the things you have been taught, you know they are true, for you know you can trust those who taught you. You've been taught the Holy Scriptures from childhood, and they have given you the wisdom to receive the salvation that comes from trusting in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true, to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we're wrong. It teaches us what to do to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip us, equip His people to do every good work. I solemnly urge you in the presence of God in Christ Jesus, who will someday judge the living and the dead when he comes to set up his kingdom. Preach the word of God. Be prepared whether the time is favorable or not. Patiently correct. Uh, patiently. Hold on. Sorry. Patiently. Wait, I just lost myself again. Where am I? Patiently correct, rebuke, and encourage people with good teaching. For time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject the truth and chase after myths. But you should keep a clear mind in every situation. Do not be afraid of suffering for the Lord. Work at telling others the good news and fully carry out the ministry God has given you. As for me, my life has already been poured out as an offering to God. The time of my death is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race and I have remained faithful. And now the prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. And the prize is not just for me, but for all who eagerly wait for his appearing. Timothy, please come as soon as you can. Demas has deserted me because he loves the things of this life and has gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia and Titus has gone to Dal Dal Dalmatia. Dalmatia. 
Only Luke is with me. Bring Mark with you when you come, for this will be helpful to me in my ministry. I sent Tychicus and to Ephesus. When you come, be sure to bring the coat I left with Carpus at Troas. Also bring my books and especially my papers. Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm, but the Lord will judge him for what he has done. Be careful of him, for he fought against everything we said. The first time I was brought before the judge, no one came with me. Everyone abandoned me. May it not be counted against them. But the Lord stood with me and gave me strength that I might preach the good news in its entirety for the Gentiles to hear. And, re and he rescued me from certain death. Yes, and the Lord will deliver me from every evil attack and will bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. All glory to God forever and ever. Amen. Give my greetings to Priscilla and Aquila and those living in the household of um, Anis Anisiphorus. Erastus stayed at Corinth and I left Trophimus. <laughs> Paul, come on, help me with the names, dude. And I left Trophimus sick at Mil Miletus? Miletus? I don't know. Do your best to get here before winter. Ebulus sends your greetings, and so do Pudens and Linus, Claudia, and all the brothers and sisters. May the Lord be with you in spirit, and may his grace be with you all. All right. We are going on to Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter one. Let me just check one thing here, guys. Oh, okay. We have two two more books. We have Hebrews and Revelation that are long, and the rest aren't very long. All right. Titus one. This letter is from Paul, a slave of God and the apostle of Jesus Christ. I have been sent to proclaim faith to those who had chosen and to teach to know the truth, those that show them how to live a godly life. This truth gives them confidence that they have given. Hold on one second. Sorry, I'm texting my wife right now. All right. This truth gives them confidence that they have eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised them before the world began. And now at just the right time, he has revealed this message, which he announced to everyone. It is by the command of God, our Savior, that I have been entrusted this work for him. I'm writing to Titus, my true son in the faith that we share. May God the Father and Christ our Savior give you grace and peace. I left you on the island of Crete so you could complete our work and there appoint elders in each town as I instructed you. An elder must live a blameless life. He must be faithful to his wife and his children must be believers. You do not have a reputation for being wild or rebellious. Wow, okay. A church leader is a manager of God's household, so he must live a blameless life. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered. He must not be a heavy drinker, violent, or dishonest with money. Rather, he must enjoy having guests in his home, and he must love doing what is good. He must live wisely and just. He must live a devout and disciplined life. He must have a strong belief and trustworthy message. He was taught when we... He, mu he was taught... Then he will be able to encourage others with wholesome teaching and show those who oppose him they are wrong. For there are many rebellious people who engage in useless talk and deceive others. This is especially true of those who insist on circumcision for salvation. They must be silenced because they are turning whole families away from the truth by their false teachings. And they do it only for money. Even one of their own men, a prophet from Crete, who said about them, the people of Crete are liars, cruel animals, and lazy gluttons. This is true, so reprimand them sternly to make them strong in the faith. They must stop listening to Jewish myths and commands of people who have turned away from the truth. Everything is pure, those who those whose hearts are pure, but nothing is pure to those who are corrupt and unbelieving, because their minds and conscience are corrupted. Such people claim they know God, but they deny him by the way they live. They're detestable and disobedient and worthless for doing anything good. Wow, okay, Paul. We see you, Paul. As for you, Titus, promote the kind of living that reflects wholesome teaching. Teach the older men to exercise self-control, to be worthy of respect, and to live wisely. They must have sound faith and it filled with love and patience. Similarly, teach the older women to live in a way that honors God. They must not slander others or be heavy drinkers. Instead, they should teach others what is good. These older women must train the younger women to love their husband and their children, to live wisely and pure, to work in their homes, to do good, and to be submissive to their husbands when they shall not bring shame to the word of God. In the same way, we encourage young men to live wisely. And you yourselves must be an example of doing good works of every kind. Let everything you do reflect the integrity and seriousness of your teaching. Teach the truth that your teaching can't be criticized. Then those who oppose us will be ashamed and have nothing bad to say about it. Slaves must always obey their masters and do their best to please them. They must not talk back or still, but must show themselves entirely trustworthy and good. Then they will make the teachings about God, our Savior, attractive in every way. For the grace of God has been revealed, bringing salvation to all people, and we are instructed to turn from godless living and sinful pleasures. We should live in this evil world world with wisdom righteousness and devotion to god but we look forward with hope to that wonderful day when the glory of our lord great of god and savior jesus christ will be revealed he gave his life to free us from every kind of sin to cleanse us and to make us his very own people totally committed to doing good deeds you must teach these things and encourage the believers to do them you may have you have the authority to correct them when necessary so don't let anyone disregard what you say chapter three 
Remind the believers to submit to the government and its officers. They should be obedient, always ready to do what is good. They must not slander anyone and must avoid quarreling. Instead, they should be gentle and show humility to everyone. Once we too were foolish and disobedient, we were misled and became slaves to many lusts and pleasures. Our lives were full of evil and envy and we hated each other. But when God our Savior revealed his kindness to us, he saved us not because of the righteous things we have done, but because of his mercy. He washed away our sins, giving us a new birth and new life through the Holy Spirit. He generously poured out his spirit upon us through Christ our Savior because because of his grace, he made us right in his sight and gave us confidence that we will inherit eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying, and I want to insist on I want you to insist on these teachings so that all who trust in God will devote themselves to doing good. These teachings are good and beneficial for everyone. Do not get involved in foolish discussions about spiritual pedigrees or in quarrels or fights about obedience to Jewish laws. These things are useless and a waste of time. If people are causing divisions among you, give a first and then second warning. After that, have nothing more to do with them. For people like that have turned away from the truth and their own sins condemn them. I'm planning to send another Ar Artemis or Tyca Tychicus to you as soon as every time I say that guy's name, I pronounce it different. As soon as one of them arrives, do your best to meet them at Nic Nicopolis, for I've decided to stay there for the winter. Do everything you can to help Zanus, the lawyer, and Apollos on their trip, so that they are given everything they need. Our people must learn to do good by meeting the urgent needs of others. When they'll be unproductive, then they w they will not be unproductive. Everybody here sends greetings. Please give greetings to believers, all who love us. May God's grace be with you all. Okay, Philemon chapter one, or some as you might some of you might call it Philemon. This letter is from Paul, a prisoner for preaching the good news about Christ Jesus and from our brother Timothy. I'm writing to Philemon, our beloved co-worker, and to our sister Athia, and to our fellow soldier Archippus, and to the church that meets in your house. May God, our Father, and Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. I always thank God when I pray for you, Philemon, because I keep hearing about your faith in the Lord Jesus and all the love you have for God's people. And I'm praying that you will put it into action, the generosity that comes from your faith as you understand and experience all the good things we have in Christ. Your love has given me much joy and comfort, my brother, for your kindness has often refreshed the hearts of God's people. That is why I'm boldly asking for, of you. I could not demand it in the name of Christ because it's the right thing for you to do. But because of our love, I would prefer to simply ask you, consider this as a request from me, Paul, an old man, and also a prisoner for the sake of Christ. I appeal to show you kindness to my child, An Onesimus. I became his father in the faith while we were in prison. Onesimus hasn't been much use to you in the past, but now he's very useful to both of us. I'm sending him back to you and with him comes my own heart. I wanted to keep him here with me a while while I was in these chains for preaching the good news and he would have helped me on your behalf, but I didn't want to go do anything without your consent. I wanted I wanted you to help because you were willing, not because you were forced. It seems you lost Onesimus for a little while so that you could have him back forever. He is no longer a slave to you. He is more than a slave. He is a beloved brother, especially to me. Now he will mean much more to you, both as a man and as a brother in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, welcome him in as you welcome me. If he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it and I will not mention that you owe me, that you owe me your very soul. Yes, my brother, please do this favor for the Lord's sake. Give me this encouragement in Christ. I'm confident that as I write this letter that you will do what I ask and even more. One more thing. Please prepare a guest room for me for I'm hoping that God will answer your prayers and let me return to you soon. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, send you his greeting. So do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my co-workers. May the grace and the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. All right, here we go. We are Hebrews chapter 1. <laughs> eight hours honestly guys i did not i thought we were gonna finish before eight hours i literally was like there's no way it's gonna take us eight hours to go from john to revelation but here we are eight hours later at 7 p.m we started at 11 a lot of you guys are still here we lose a couple hundred every time we switch over to something but we're back yeah if it's blurry refresh it'll be good we're still running smooth this is only by the grace of god our internet has not cut out once today but let me just stretch for a second before we uh move on All right, eight hours, eight hours. There it is. Praise the Lord. Let's get some, I don't know what, celebration emojis still here. Some of you have been here the whole time. We've had a steady like 1,500 to 2,000 the whole time, which is crazy. I thought maybe a couple hundred, honestly. I always shoot really low with like how many people are going to actually be in our streams. But yeah, we have Hebrews, big book, and then we have Revelation. I'm actually, Revelation is my favorite book in the Bible. So it's going to be a great way to end it. It'll be very, very good. I feel good after eight hours. I mean, I feel good as long as I take, I took two 10 minute breaks so far. And those like super, super helped. I took one at three hours and I took one at seven, I believe like seven hours. And those like really, really help. I feel like a new person when I walk out.
get something quick to eat and drink, and then come back in my office, I feel like a, a new creation. So, here we go. It's not the streaming for eight hours that's tiring, it's the reading out loud for eight hours. That's what make, that's what's hard for me. Or that's what's hard, is actually having to speak out, not just like, I feel like I could read in my head for like 15 hours and be live and be fine, but it's just the actually having to read out loud and process. Because if you're reading in your head and you mess up a word or you skip over something, you just keep reading, right? Like your mind sometimes just creates thoughts while you're reading and it makes sense. But when you're reading out loud for thousands of people, you have to actually like pronunciate things and read things properly. So that's the part that's... Yeah, we've done only 20 minutes total in breaks. So yeah, that's pretty cool. We've been plowing through. 3 a.m. still buzzing. Let's go, Shell. All right, here we go. This is the home stretch. Hebrews is long and Revelation is long and the rest are short. So we're, we're right there, guys. Stay with me. We're right there. Here we go. Here we go. Okay. We are in Hebrews. Nobody knows who wrote the book of Hebrews, just for a heads up, but here we go. Long ago, God spoke many times and in many ways to our ancestors through the prophets. And now in these final days, he has spoken to us through a son. God promised everything to the son as an inheritance and through the son, he created the universe. The sun radiates God's own glory and expresses the very character of God, and he sustains everything by the mighty power of his command. When he had cleansed us from our sins, he sat down in the place of honor at the right hand of the majestic God in heaven. This shows that the sun is far greater than the angels, just as the name of God is far greater. Him is greater than their names. For God never said to an angel what he said to Jesus. You are my son. Today I've become your father. God also said, I will be his father and he will be my son. And when he brought brought his supreme son to the world god said let all of god's angels worship him regarding the angels he says he sends his angels like the winds his servants like flames of fire but to the son he says your throne O god endures forever and ever you rule with the scepter of justice you love justice and hate evil therefore god your god has anointed you pouring out the oil of joy on you more than anyone else he also said to the son says in the beginning lord you laid the foundation of the earth and made the heavens with your hands they will perish but you remain forever they will wear out like old clothing they, you will fold them up like a cloak and discard them like old clothing but you're always the same you will live forever and god never said to any of the angels sit in my place of honor at my right hand until i humble your enemies making them a footstool under your feet therefore angels are only servants spirits sent to care for people who will inherit salvation Chapter two, so we must listen carefully to the truth we have heard or we may drift away from it. For the message of God delivered through angels has always stood firm and every violation of the law and every act of disobedience was punished. So what makes us think we can escape if we ignore the great salvation that was first announced by the Lord Jesus himself and then he delivered to us delivered to us by those who heard him speak and god confirmed the message by giving signs and wonders and various miracles and gifts of the holy spirit whenever he chose and furthermore it is not angels who will control the future wor world we are talking about for in one place scripture says what are mere mortals that you should think about them or the son of man that you should care for him yet you yet for a little while you made them a lo little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You gave them authority over all things. Now when it says all things, it means nothing is left out, but we have not seen all things put under authority. What we do see is Jesus, who for a little while was given a position a little lower than the angels, and because he suffered death for us, he is now crowned with glory and honor. Yes, by God's grace, Jesus tasted death for everyone. God for whom, God for whom and through whom everything was made chose to bring many children into glory and it was only right that he should make jesus through his suffering a perfect leader fit to bring them bring them into their salvation so now jesus and the ones who make holy have the same father that is why jesus is not ashamed to call his brothers call us to call them brothers and sisters for he said to god i'll proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters i will praise you among your assembled people he also said i will put my trust in him that is i and the children god has given me because god's children are human beings made of flesh and blood the son also became flesh and blood for only as a human being could he die and only by dying he could break the power of the devil who had the power of death only in this way could he set free all those who lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying we also know that the son did not come to help angels but he came to help the descendants of abraham therefore it was necessary for him to be made in every respect like us his brothers and sisters so that he could be our merciful and faithful high priest before god then he could offer a sacrifice that could take away the sins of the people since he himself has gone through suffering and testing he is able to help us when we are being tested hebrews chapter 3. 
And so, dear brothers and sisters who belong to God and who are partners with those who called to heaven, think carefully about this Jesus whom we declare to be God's messenger and high priest. For he was faithful to God who appointed him just as Moses there faithfully when he entrusted with God's entire house. But Jesus deserves far more glory than Moses, just as a person who builds a house deserves more praise than the house itself. For every house has a builder, but the one who built everything is God. Moses was certainly a faithful was certainly faithful in God's house as a servant. His work was an illustration of the truth God would reveal later. But Christ, as the Son, is in charge of God's entire house, and we are God's house if we keep courage and remain confident in our hope in G Christ. That is why the Holy Spirit says, Today when you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts, as Israel did when they rebelled. When they tested me in the wilderness, there your ancestors tested and tried my patience, even though they saw my miracles for 40 years. So I was angry with them, and I said, Their hearts always turn away from me. They refused to do what I tell them, so in my anger I took on an oath, they will enter my place of rest. Be careful then, dear brothers and sisters. Make sure that your own hearts are not evil and unbelieving, turning away from the living God. You must warn each other every day, which is still today, that none of you will be deceived by the sin and your heart against God. For if we are faithful to the end, trusting God just as firmly as when we first believed, he will share in all that belongs to Christ. Remember what it says. Today, when you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts as Israel did when they rebelled. And who was it that rebelled against God, even though they heard his voice? Wasn't it the people that Moses led out of Egypt and those who made God angry for 40 years? Wasn't it the people who sinned, whose corpses lay in the wilderness, and to whom God has been speaking when he took an oath that they would never enter his rest? Wasn't it the people who disobeyed him? So we see that because of their unbelief, they were not able to enter into his rest. Chapter 4. God's promise of entering his rest still stands, so we ought to tremble with fear that some of you may fail to experience it. For this, for this good news that God has prepared this rest has been announced to us just as it was just as it was to them. But it did them no good because they didn't share the faith of those who listened to God. For only we who believe can enter his rest. As for the others, God said, in my anger I took an oath, they will never enter my place of rest. Even though this rest has been ready since we, he made the world, we know it's ready because of the place in scripture where it mentions the seventh day. On the seventh day, God rested from all his work, but in other passages, God said, they will never enter my rest. So God's rest is there for people to enter, but those who first hear the good news failed to enter because they disobeyed God. So God said another time for entering his rest, and that time is today. God announced through David a much later word already quoted, today when you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. Now, if Joshua had succeeded in giving them this rest, God would have not spoken about another day of rest to come. So there's a special day of rest waiting for the people of God. For all who have entered into God's rest have rested from their labors just as God did after creating the world. So let us do our best to enter that rest, but if we disobey God, as the people of Israel did, we will fall. For the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes. And this is one whom we are accountable. So then we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of, our, of ours understands our weakness for he faced all the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. Therefore, there we will receive his mercy and we will find grace to help in our in, uh, help us when we need it most. Hebrews 5. Every high priest is a man chosen to represent other people in their dealings with God. He represents their gift to God and offers sacrifice for their sins and he's able to deal with gently with ignorant and wayward people because he himself is subject to the same weakness. That is why we must offer sacrifices for his own sins as well as theirs. And no one can become a high priest simply because he wants such an honor. He must be called by God for this work just as Aaron was. This is why Christ did not honor himself by assuming he could become a high priest. No, he was chosen by God who said to him, you are my son, today I become your father. I have become your father. And another passage God said to him, you are the priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. While Jesus was on earth, he offered prayers and pleadings with a loud cry and tears excuse me to the one who could rescue him from death and God heard his prayers and because his deep reverence for God even though Jesus was God's son he learned obedience from the things he suffered in this way God qualified him as a perfect high priest and became the source of eternal salvation for all who believe him and God designated him to be the high priest in the order of Melchizedek there is much more we'd like to say about this, but it's difficult to explain, especially since you're spiritually dull and you don't seem to listen. You've been believers for so long, by now you ought to be teaching others. Instead, you need someone to teach you again the basic things about God's word. You're like babies who need milk and cannot eat solid food. For someone who lives on milk is still an infant and doesn't know how to do what is right. Solid food is for those who are mature, who through training have the skills to recognize the difference between right and wrong. 
So let us stop going over chapter six. So let us stop going over the basic teachings of Christ again and again. Let us go on instead and become mature in our understanding. Surely we don't need to start again with the fundamental, fundamental importance of repenting from evil deeds and placing faith in God. You don't need any further instruction about baptisms, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And so, God willing, we will move forward to further understanding. For it is impossible to bring back to repentance those who are once enlightened, those who have experienced the good things of heaven and shared in the Holy Spirit, those who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the power of the age to come, and who then turn away from God. It is impossible to bring such people back to repentance. By rejecting the Son of God, they themselves are nailing him to the cross once again and holding him to public shame. When the ground soaks up the falling rain and bears a good crop for the farmer, it has God's blessing. But if a field bears thorns and thistles, it's useless. The farmer will soon condemn the field and burn it. Dear friends, even though we are talking this way, we really don't believe it applies to you. We are confident that you are meant for better things, things that come with salvation. For God is not unjust. He will not forget how hard you have worked for him and how you have shown your love and caring for caring other believers, and you still do. Our great desire is that you will keep on loving others as long as life lasts in order to make certain that what you hope for will come true. Then you will not become spiritually dull and indifferent. Instead, you will follow the example of those who are going to inherit God's promises because of their faith and endurance. For example, there was a God's promise to Abraham. Since there was no one greater to swear by him, God took an oath by his own name, saying, I will certainly bless you and I will multiply your descendants beyond the number. Then Abraham waited patiently and received what God had promised. Now when people take an oath, they call on someone greater than themselves to hold them to it. And without question, the oath is binding. God also bound himself with an oath so that those who received the promise could be perfectly sure that he would never change his mind. So God has given both his promise and an oath. These two things are unchangeable because it's impossible for God to lie. Therefore, we who have fled to him for refuge can have great confidence as we hold to the hope that lies before us. This hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls. It leads us through the curtain into God's inner sanctuary. Jesus has already gone in there for us. He's become our eternal high priest in the order of Melchizedek. This Melchizedek king, of the city of Salem and also and also a priest of God most high when Abraham was returning home after winning a great battle against the kings Melchizedek met him and blessed him then Abraham took a tenth of all he had captured in the battle and gave it to Melchizedek the name Melchizedek means king of justice and the king of Salem means king of peace there's no record of his father or mother or any other ancestors no beginning or end to his life he remains a priest forever resembling the son of God consider then how great this Melchizedek was even Abraham the great patriarch of Israel recognized this by giving him a tenth of what he had taken in battle. Now the law of Moses required that the priests who are descendants of Levi must collect a tenth from the rest of the people of Israel who are also descendants of Abraham. But Melchizedek, who was not a descendant of Levi, collected a tenth from Abraham and Melchizedek, placed a blessing upon Abraham, the one who had already received the promise of God. And without question, the person who has the power to give a blessing is greater than the one who was blessed. The priests... Stay with me, guys. I know this is long. The priests who collect tithes are... I say that after an hour and 13 minutes. I mean, eight hours and 13 minutes. Okay. The priests who collect tithes are men who die. So Melchizedek is greater than they are because we are told that he lives on. In addition, we might even say that these Levites, the ones who collect the tithe, paid a tithe to Melchizedek when their ancestors Abraham paid a tithe to him. For although Levi wasn't born yet, the seed from which was come in Abraham's body was Melchizedek collected the tenth from him, the tithe from him. So if the priesthood of the Levi on which the law was based could have achieved the perfection God intended, why did God need to establish a different priesthood? With a priest in, in the order of Melchizedek instead of the order of Levi and Aaron. And if the priesthood is changed, the law must also be changed to permit it. For the priest we are talking about belongs to a different tribe whose members have never served at the altars as a priest. What I mean is our Lord came from the tribe of Judah and Moses never mentioned priests coming from that tribe. This change has been made very clear since different priests who is like Melchizedek has appeared. Jesus became a priest not by meeting the physical requirements of belonging to the tribe of Levi, but by the power of life of a life that cannot be destroyed. And the psalmist pointed this out when he prophesied, you are the priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Yes, the old requirement about the priesthood was set aside because it was weak and useless. For the law never made anything perfect, but now we have confidence in a better hope though which we draw near to God. This new system was established with a solemn oath. Aaron's descendants became priests with such an oath, but there's an oath regarding Jesus for God said to him, 
the Lord has taken an oath and will not break his vow, you are a priest forever. Because of this oath, Jesus is the one who guarantees his better covenant with God. There are many priests under the old system for death prevented them from remaining in office, but because Jesus lives forever, his priesthood lasts forever. Therefore, he is able once and forever to save those who come to God through him. He lives forever to intercede with God on their behalf. Wow, that's amazing. He's the kind of high priest we need because he's holy and blameless and unstained by sin. He has been set apart from sinners and has been given the highest place of honor in heaven. Unlike those other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices every day. They did this for their own sins first and then for the sins of the people. But Jesus did this once and offered himself as a sacrifice for all people's sins. This is a long chapter. Okay. The law appointed high priests who were limited by human weakness. But after the law was given, God appointed his son with an oath. And the son has been made the perfect high priest forever. That is a long chapter. Lots of words. Okay. Hebrews chapter 8. Here is the main point. We have a high priest who sat down in the place of honor beside the throne of the majestic God in heaven. There he ministers in the heavenly tabernacle, the true place of worship that was built by the Lord, not by human hands. Wow, there he ministers right now in the heavenly tabernacle. And since every high priest is re required to offer gifts and sacrifices, our high priest must make an offering too. If we, if he were here on earth, he would not even be a priest since there already are priests who offer the gifts required by the law. They serve in a system of the worship that is only a copy, a shadow of the real one in heaven. But when Moses, for when Moses was getting ready to build the tabernacle, God gave him this warning, be sure that you make everything according to the pattern I've shown you here on the mountain. But now Jesus, our high priest, has been given a ministry that is far superior to the old priesthood, for he is the one who mediates for us far better covenant with God based on better promises. If the first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no need for a second covenant to replace it. But then God found fault with the people, he said. But when God found fault with the people, he said, The day is coming, says the Lord. When I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah, this covenant will not be like the one I made with their ancestors. When I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt, they did not remain faithful to my covenant. So I over, so I turned my back on them, says the Lord. But this is my new covenant I will make with the people of Israel on that day, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and I'll write them on their hearts. I'll be their God and they will be my people. They will not need to teach their neighbors, nor will they need to teach their relatives, saying, you should know the Lord. For everyone from the least to the greatest will know will know me already and I'll forgive their wickedness and I'll never again remember their sins. But when God speaks of a new covenant, it means he has made the first one obsolete. It is now out of date and will soon disappear. Hebrews 9. Excuse me. All right. Hebrews is definitely a lot of words. That first covenant between God and Israel had regulations for worship and a place of worship here on earth. There were two rooms in the tabernacle and that first room there was a lampstand a table and sacred loaves of bread on the table this room was called the holy place then there was a curtain and behind the curtain was a second room called the most holy place in that room there were gold incense altar and wooden chests called the ark of the covenant which was covered with gold on all sides inside the ark there were gold jars containing manna Aaron's staff sprouted leaves and the stone tablets of the covenant above the ark there were cherubim of divine divine glory whose wings stretched over the ark's cover the place of atonement but we cannot explain these things in detail now when these things were in place, the priests regularly entered the first room as they performed their religious duties. But only the high priest ever entered the most high holy place and only once a year. And he always offered blood for his own sins and, that, and for the sins of the people who had committed ignorance. But these regulations of the Holy Spirit revealed that the entrance of the most holy was not fully open as long as the tabernacle and the system represented it were still in use. This is an illustration pointing to the present time for the gifts and sacrifice that the priests offer are not able to cleanse the conscience of the people who bring them. For that old system deals only with food and drinks and various cleansing ceremonies, physical regulations that were in effect only until a better system could be established. I hope you guys are tracking. It's all about this old covenant versus the new covenant. So Christ has now become the high priest over all the good things that have come. We, he has entered the greater, more perfect tabernacle in heaven, which was not made by human hands and is not part of the created world. With his own blood, not the blood of goats and calves, he entered the most holy place once for all and secured our redemption forever under the old system the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer could cleanse people's bodies from ceremonial impurity just think of how much more blood of the blood of christ will purify our conscience from sinful deeds so that we can worship the god for the power of the eternal spirit christ offered himself to god as a perfect sacrifice to our sins that is why he is the one who mediates a new covenant i feel like i'm reading a huge contract here 
who re mediates a new covenant between God and people so that all people who are called can receive eternal inheritance God has promised them. For Christ died to set them free from the penalty of sin they had committed under the first covenant. Now when someone leaves a will, it is necessary to prove that the person who made it is dead. The will goes into effect after the person's death. While the person who made it is still alive, the will cannot be put into effect. That is why even the first covenant was put into effect with the blood of an animal. For after Moses had read each of God's commandments to all the people, he took the blood of calves and goats along with water and sprinkled blood of the book of God's law and all the people using hyssop branches and scarlet wool. Then he said, this blood confirms the covenant God has made with you. And in the same way, we sprinkled blood on the tabernacle and everything used for worship. In fact, according to the law of Moses, nearly everything was purified with blood for without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. That is why the tabernacle and everything in it, which were copies of things in heaven, had to be purified by the blood of animals. But the real thing in heaven had to be purified with far better sacrifices than the blood of animals. But Christ did not enter into a holy place made with human hands, which was only a copy of the true one in heaven. He entered into heaven itself to appear now before God on our behalf. And he did not enter the heaven to offer himself again and again like the high priest here on earth who enters the most holy place year after year with the blood of an animal if that had been necessary christ would have to die again and again ever since the world began but now once for all he has appeared at the end of the age to remove sin by his own death as a sacrifice and just as each person is destined to die once and after that comes judgment so also christ was offered once for all time as a sacrifice to take away the sins of many people he will come again not to deal with our sins but to bring salvation to all who eagerly wait for him Whew. Let me take a sip of water here. All right, guys, we're we're out, we're heading towards the finish line. This is definitely. I think that Romans was the easiest book to read, and so far Hebrews has been the hardest for me, the hardest book to read. Yeah, definitely. All right, it's just really, really wordy. Chapter ten: the old system under the old system under the law of Moses was only a shadow. A dim preview of the good things to come, not the good things themselves. The sacrifices under that system were repeated again and again, year after year, but they were never able to provide perfect cleansing for those who come to worship. If they could have provided perfect cleansing, the sacrifices would have stopped, for the worshipers would have been purified once for all time and their feelings of guilt would have disappeared. But instead, those sacrifices actually reminded us of their sins year after year. For it is not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. That is why when Christ came into the world, he said to God, you did not want animal sacrifices or sin offerings, but you have given me a body to offer. You were not pleased with burnt offerings or other offerings for sin. Then I said, look, I have come to you, do your will, O God, as written about me in scripture. Guys, make sure you like the video too, because it's a new stream. So we started at zero likes again. So make sure you like and share if you haven't. That's not in the Bible. That's just a side note. Verse eight, first Christ said, you did not want animal sacrifices or sin offerings or burnt offerings or other offerings for sin, nor were you pleased with them. Then he said, I look, I've come to do your will. He cancels the first covenant in order to put the second into effect. For God's will was for us to be made holy by the sacrifice of the body of Jesus, Jesus Christ once for all time. Under the old covenant, the priest stands and ministers before the altar day after day, offering the same sacrifice again and again, which can never take away sins. But our high priest offered himself to God as a single sacrifice for sins, good for all time. Then he sat down in the place of honor at God's right hand. There he waits until his enemies are humbled and made a footstool under his feet. For by that one offering, he forever made himself perfect, those who are being made holy. And the Holy Spirit also testifies to this. So, for he says, this is the new covenant I will make with all the people on that day, says the Lord. I will put my laws in the hearts and I'll write them on their minds. Then he says, I will never again remember their sins and lawless deeds. And, and when sins have been forgiven, there's no need to offer any more sacrifices. And so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most high... Um, holy place because of the blood of Jesus. By his death, Jesus opened a new li way of give uh, a new life giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. And since we have a great high priest who rules over God's house, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him from our guilty conscience have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean and our bodies have been washed with pure water. Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm. For God can be trusted by his promise. Let us think of ways to motivate one another in acts of love and good work. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of the Lord is drawing near. Dear friends, if we deliberately continue sinning after we've received the knowledge of the truth, there's no longer any sacrifice that will cover these sins. There's only terrible expectation of God's judgment with raging fire he will consume his enemies. For anyone who refused to obey the law of Moses was put to death with no mercy, on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Just think of how much worse the punishment will be for those who have trampled on the Son of God and have treated the blood of the covenant, which made us holy as if it were common and unholy, and have insulted and disdained the Holy Spirit who brings mercy to Christ, mercy to us. For we know the one who said, I will take revenge, I will pay them back. 
He also said the Lord will judge his own people. It is a terrible thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Think back on those early days when you first learned about Christ. Remember how you remained faithful even though it meant terrible suffering. Sometimes you were exposed to public ridicule and were beaten, but sometimes you helped others who were suffering the same things. You suffered along with those who were thrown into jail, and when you... and and when all you owned was taken from you, you accepted it with joy. You knew there were better things waiting for you that will last forever. So do not throw away this confident trust in the Lord. Remember the great reward it brings you. Patient endurance is what you need to, you need now, so you'll continue to do God's will. Then you'll receive all that God has promised. For in just a little while, the coming one will come and not delay. And my righteous ones will live by faith, but I'll take no pleasure on any, in anyone who turns away. But we are not like those who turn away from God to their own destruction. We are the faithful ones whose souls will be saved. All right, Hebrews 11. How many chapters does Hebrews have? 13 chapters? Okay, we're, we're getting there towards the end of Hebrew. All right, <laughs> these chapters are so long. We just went from like Timothy to these massive chapters. Okay, Hebrews 11. Faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. Through their faith, the people in the days of old earned a good reputation. Oh, I love this chapter. By faith, we understand that the entire universe was formed at God's command, that what we see now did not come from anything that can be seen. It was by faith that Abel brought more than acceptable offering than Cain did. Abel's offering gave evidence that he was a righteous man and God showed his approval of his gifts. Although Abel is long dead, it speaks he speaks to us by his example of faith. It was by faith that Enoch was taken up to heaven without dying. He disappeared because God took him. For before he was taken up, he was known as a person who pleased God, and it's impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. It was by faith that Noah built a large boat to save his family from the flood. He obeyed God who warned him about things that had never happened before. By faith, by his faith, Noah condemned the rest of the world and he received the righteousness that comes from faith, by faith. It was by faith that Abraham obeyed when God called him to leave home and go to another land that God would give him his inheritance. He went without knowing where he was going, and even when he reached the land that God promised him, he lived there by faith, for he was like a foreigner living in tents, and so did Isaac and Jacob, who inherited the same promise. Abraham was confidently looking forward to a city with eternal foundations, a city built by God. It was by faith that Sarah was able to have a child, although she was barren and was too old. She believed that God would keep his promise, and so a whole nation came from his from one man who is good as dead. A nation whose many people, like the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore, there's no way to count them. All these people still died believing that God, what God had promised them. They did not receive what was promised, but they saw it all from a distance and welcomed it. They agreed that they were foreigners and nomads here on this earth. Obviously people, obviously people who say such things are looking forward to a country they can call their own. If they had longed for the country they came from, they would have gone back but they were looking for a better place, a heavenly homeland. That is why God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he was prepared a city for them. It was by faith that Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice when God was testing him. Abraham, who had received God's promise, was ready to sacrifice his only son, Isaac. Even though God told him, Isaac is a son through whom your descendants will be counted. Abraham reasoned that if Isaac died, God was able to bring him back to life again. And in a sense, Abraham did receive his son back from the dead. It was by faith that Isaac promised blessings for the future of his sons, Jacob and Esau. It was by faith that Jacob, when he was old and dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons and bowed in worship as he leaned on his staff. It was by faith that Joseph, when he was about to die, said confidently that the people of Israel would leave Egypt even when commanded to take his bones with them when he left. It was by faith that Moses' parents hid him for three months when he was born. They saw that God given, they saw that God had given them an unusual child and they were not afraid to disobey the king's command. It was by faith that Moses, when he grew up, re refused, to call this, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to share the oppression of his people instead of enjoying the fleeting pleasures of sin. He thought it was better to suffer for the sake of Christ than to own the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking ahead to his great reward. It was by faith that Moses left the land of Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He kept right on going because he kept his eye on the one who was invisible. It was by faith that Moses commanded the people of Israel to keep the Passover and to sprinkle blood on the doorposts so that the angel of death would not kill his firstborn. I hope you guys are getting the drift here. It was by faith that the people of Israel went through the Red Sea as though they were on dry ground, but when the Egyptians tried to follow, they all drowned. It was by faith that the people of Israel marched around Jericho for seven days and the walls came crashing down. 
It was by faith that Rahab, the prostitute, was not destroyed with people in her city who refused to obey God for she had given a welcome to the spies. How much more do I need to say? It would take a long time to recount the stories, the faith of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and all the prophets. By faith, these people overthrew kingdoms. They ruled with justice and they received what God had promised them. They shut the mouth of lions. They quenched the flames of fire and escaped the deaths of the edge of the sword. Their weakness was turned to strength. They became strong in battle and put whole armies to flight. Women received their loved ones back again from the dead, but those who were tortured re refused to turn from God in order to be set free. They placed their hope in a better life after the resurrection. Some were jeered at, their backs were cut open with whips, others were chained in prison, some died by stoning, some were sawed in half, and others were killed with a sword. Some went about wearing skins of sheep and goats, destitute, oppressed, and mistreated. They were too good for this world, wandering around. Let me read that again because that's so powerful. They were too good for this world, wandering over deserts and mountains, hiding in caves and holes in the grounds. All these people earned a good reputation because of their faith, yet none of them received what God had promised. For God had something better in mind for us so that they would not reach perfection without us. Wow, Hebrews 11. Can we get a one in the chat for Hebrews 11? That last, that last couple of verses, super good, okay. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith, because the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. Think of all the hostility he endured from sinful people, then you won't become weary and give up. After all, you have not yet given your lives in your struggle against sin. And you have gotten the encouraging words from uh, words God spoke to you as children. He said, my child, don't make light of the Lord's discipline and don't give up when he corrects you. For the Lord disciplines those that he loves and punishes each one of you, uh, each one he accepts as his child. As you endure his divine discipline, remember that God is treating you as his own children. Have you ever had a, have you ever heard of a child who has never been disciplined by its father? If God doesn't discipline you as he does all of his children, it means that you're not, you're illegitimate and you're not really God's child at all. Since we respected our earthly fathers who disciplined us, shouldn't we submit more to the discipline of the father of our spirits and live forever? Excuse me. I had to clear my throat there. Okay, no, discipline is enjoyable while it's happening, it's painful, but afterwards there will be a peaceful harvest of right living for those who are trained in this way. So take a new grip with your tired hands and strengthen your weak knees. Mark out a straight path for your feet so that you are weak, for, so that those who are weak and lame will not fall out because of strength. Work at living in peace with everyone and work at living a holy life for those who are not holy will not see the Lord. Look after each other so that none of you fails to live to receive the graces of God. Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble youth corrupting many. Make sure that no one is immoral or godless like Esau who traded his birthright for the firstborn son of a single meal. You know that afterward, when he wanted his father's blessing, he rejected it. It was too late for repentance, even though he was begged bitter tears. You have not come to a physical mountain to a place of flaming fire, darkness, gloom, and whirlwind as the Israelites did at Mount Sinai. For they heard an awesome trumpet blast and a voice so terrible that they begged God to stop speaking. They staggered back under God's command, even if an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned to death. Moses himself was so frightened at the sight that he said, I'm terrified and trembling. No, you have come to Mount Sinai, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to countless thousands of angels in joyful gathering. You have come to the assembly of God's firstborn children, those whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God himself, who is the judge over all things. You have come to the spirits of the righteousness ones in heaven who have not been made perfect. You have come to Jesus, the one who mediates the new covenant between God and people, and to the sprinkled blood, which speaks of forgiveness instead of crying out for vengeance like the blood of Abel. Be careful that you do not refuse to listen to the one who is speaking, for if the people of Israel did not escape when they refused to listen to Moses, the earthly messenger, we will certainly not escape when we reject the one who speaks to us from heaven. When God spoke from Mount Sinai, his voice shook the earth, but now he makes another promise. Once again, I will not shake only the earth, but the heavens also. This means that all of creation will be shaken and removed so that only the unshakable things will remain. Since we are receiving a kingdom that is unshakable, let us be thankful and please God by worshiping him with holy fear and awe, for God is a devouring fire. This is the last chapter. Yes, this is the last chapter of Hebrews. We've been 33 minutes on just Hebrews so far. Okay. Here we go. We can do this. We can do this. Okay. 
Keep on loving each other as brothers and sisters. Don't forget to show hospitality to strangers for some have done this and have entertained angels without realizing it. Remember those in prison as if you were there yourself. Remember those also being mistreated as if you felt the pain in your own bodies. Give honor to marriage and remain faithful to one another in marriage. God will surely judge people who are immoral and those that commit adultery. Don't love money. Be satisfied with what you have. For God said, I will never fail you. I will never abandon you. So we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will have no fear. What can mere people do to me? Remember your leaders who taught you the word of God. Think of all the good that has come from their lives and follow the example of their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So do not be attracted by strange new ideas. Your strength comes from God's grace, not from rules without food, which do not help those who follow them. We have an altar from which the high priest of the tabernacle have no right to eat. Under the old system, the high priest brought the blood of animals into the holy place as a sacrifice for sin, and the bodies of the animals were burned outside the camp. So also Jesus suffered and died outside of the city gates to make his holy make up to make his people holy by means of his own blood. So let us go out to him outside the camp and bear the disgrace he bore. For the world is not our permanent home. We are looking forward to a home yet to come. Therefore, let us offer through Jesus a continual sacrificial praise to God, proclaiming our allegiance to his name. And don't forget to do good and to share with those in need. These are the sacrifices that please God. Obey your spiritual leaders and do what they say. Their work is to watch over your souls and they are accountable to God. Give them a reason to do this with joy, not with sorrow. They sh they, this would certainly not be for your benefit. Pray for us and for our conscience is clear that we want to live honorably in everything we do and especially pray that I'll be able to come back to you soon. Now may the God of peace who brought up from, who brought who brought up from the dead our Lord Jesus and the great shepherd of the sheep and ratified an eternal covenant with his blood. He, may he equip you with all you need for doing his will. May he produce in you through the power of Jesus Christ every good thing that is pleasing to him. All glory to him forever and ever. Amen. I urge you, dear brothers and sisters, pay attention to what I've written in this brief exhortation. I want you to know that our brother Timothy has been released from jail. If he comes here soon, I'll bring, with, bring him with me to see you. Greet all your leaders and all believers there, the believers from Italy, uh, with your, their greetings. May God's grace be with you all. Okay. Water break. We are done with Hebrews. We are so close, guys, to getting to Revelation. We are done, okay? We have a couple short books here. James, First and Second Peter, First through Third John, Jude, and then we're in Revelation. We are right there. We have 1,500 of you on right now. Praise the Lord. We're almost there. Let's let's cross this finish line here. Hebrews was 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 a lot of words. That was no joke. It took about 36 minutes to read Hebrews here. All right. I need some chopstick. Okay, we are eight hours and 36 minutes. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Here we go. We gotta go. We gotta finish this. James one. Stream cannot end till we're done. <laughs> James 1, this letter is from James, a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm writing to the 12 tribes, Jewish believers scattered abroad, greetings. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles come of any kind your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. If you need wisdom, ask our generous God and he'll give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking. But when you ask him, be sure that your faith is in God alone. Do not waver for a person with divided loyalty is unsettled as a wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. Such people should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Their loyalty is divided between the world and they are unstable in everything they do. Believers who are poor or have something to boast about for God has honored them and those who are rich should boast that God has humbled them they will fade away like a little flower in the field the hot sun rises and the grass withers the little flower droops and falls and its beauty fades away in the same way the rich will fade away with all of their achievements God blesses those who patiently endure testing and temptation afterward they will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him and remember when you're being tempted do not say God is tempting me God has never God is never tempted to do wrong and he never tempts anyone else. Temptation comes from our own desires which entice us and drag us away. These desires give birth to sinful actions and then sin, when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. So don't be misled, my brothers and sisters. Whatever is good and perfect and is a gift coming and is perfect is a gift coming down to us from the Father who created all of the lights in the heavens. We never change he never changes or casts a shifting shadow. He chose to give birth to us by giving us his true word, and we out of all creation became his prized possession. Understand this, my dear brothers and sisters. You must all be quick to listen and slow to speak and slow to get angry. 
Human anger does not produce the righteousness God desires, so get rid of all filth and evil in your lives and humbly accept the word God has planted in your hearts, for he has the power to save your souls. But don't just listen to God's word, you must do what it says, otherwise you're only fooling yourselves. For if you listen to the word and don't obey it, it's like a man glancing at his face in a mirror. You see yourself walk, walk away and forget what you look like. But if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free and do what it says and do for and do not and don't forget what you have heard, then God will bless you for doing it. If you claim to be religious but don't control your tongue, you're fooling yourself and your religion is worthless. Pure and genuine religion in the sight of God and the Father means caring for the orphans and the widow in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. Chapter 2. My dear brothers and sisters, how can you claim to have faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ if you favor some over the others? For example, suppose someone comes into your meeting dressed in fancy clothes and expensive jewelry, and another comes in who is poor and dressed in dirty clothes. If you give special attention and a good seat to the rich person, but you say to the poor one, you can't stand there or go sit on the floor. Well, doesn't this discrimination show that, ju that your judgments are guided by evil motives? Listen to me, dear brothers and sisters. Hasn't God chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith? Aren't they the ones who inherit the kingdom he has promised to those who love him? But you dishonor the poor. Isn't it the rich who oppress and drag you into court? Aren't they the ones who slander Jesus Christ, whose noble name you bear? Yes, indeed, it is good when you obey the royal laws as found in the scriptures. Love your neighbor as yourself, but if you favor someone over others, you are committing a sin. You are guilty of breaking the law. For the person who keeps all the law except one is guilty is a guilty person who has broken all of God's laws. For the same God who said you must not commit adultery also said you must not murder. So if you murder someone but do not commit adultery, you have still broken the law. So whatever you say or whatever you do, remember that you will be judged by the law that sets you free. There will be no mercy for those who have not shown mercy to others. But if you have shown mercy, being merciful, God will be merciful when he judges you. What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but you don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? Suppose you see your brother or sister who has no food or clothing, and you say, goodbye and have a good day, stay warm and eat well, but then you don't give that person any food or clothing, what good does that do? So you see, faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it's dead and useless. Now some may argue, some people have faith, some have good deeds, but I say, how can you, sh how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? I will show you my faith by my good deeds. You say you have faith. For you believe that there is one God. Good for you. Even the demons believe this and they tremble in terror. How foolish. Can't you see that faith without good deeds is useless? Don't you remember that our ancestor Abraham was shown to be right with God by his actions that he offered his son Isaac at the altar? You see, his faith and his actions worked together. His actions made his faith complete. And so it happened just as the scripture says, Abraham believed God and God counted him righteous because of his faith. Was he even called the friend of God? So you see, we are shown to be right with God by what we do, not by faith alone. Rahab the prost let me say that again so you see we are shown to be right with God by what we do not by faith alone for those of you that say works don't matter okay Rahab the prostitute is another example she was shown to be right with God by her actions when she hid those messengers and sent them safely away by a different road just as the body is dead without breath so faith is dead without good works I'm telling you people that all right anyways I'm not doing no commentary here, okay? Dear brothers and sisters, not many of you should become teachers in the church, for we will, for those who teach will be judged much more strictly. Indeed, we all make many mistakes, for if we could control our tongues, we would be perfect, and we would also control ourselves in any other way. We can make a large go horse go wherever we want by means of a small bit in its mouth, and a small rudder make a huge ship turn wherever the pilot chooses to go. Even though the winds are strong, in the same way the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches. But a tiny spark can set a forest on fire, and among all the parts of the body, the tongue is a flame of fire. It is a whole world of wickedness corrupting your entire body. It can set your whole life on fire, for it is on fire by hell itself. It is set on fire by hell itself. People can tame all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and fish. But no one can tame the tongue. It is rustless and evil and full of deadly poison. Sometimes it praises our Lord and Father, and sometimes it curses those who have been made in the image of God. And so blessing and cursing pour, um, come pouring out of the same mouth. Surely, my brothers and sisters, that is not right. Does a spring of water bubble out, bubble out with both fresh and bitter water? Does a fig tree produce both olives? Uh, grapevine produce figs? No, can, you can't draw fresh water from a salty spring. If you are wise and understand... God's ways, prove it by living an honorable life, doing good works with humility that comes from wisdom. But if you're bitterly jealous and there's selfish ambition in your heart, don't cover up the truth with your boasting and lying. For jealousy and selfish selfishness are not of God's wisdom. Such things are earthly and spiritual and demonic. 
For wherever there is jealousy and selfish ambition, there will find disorder and evil of every kind. But the wisdom from above is first of all pure. It is also peace-loving, gentle at times, and be willing to yield to others. It is full of mercy and the fruit of God's deeds. It shows no favoritism and is always sincere, since those who are peacemakers will plant seeds of peace and reap harvests of righteousness. What is causing the quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from the evil desires at war within you? You want what you don't have, and you scheme to kill to get it. You're jealous of others, of what others have, but you can't get it, so you fight and wage war to take it away from them. Yet you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. And even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are wrong. You only want it to give you pleasure. You adulterers, don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy to God? I will say it again. If you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. Do you think the scriptures have no meaning that they say that God is passionate they say that God is passionate, that the spirit he has placed within us should be faithful to him. And he gives grace generously. As the scripture says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come close to God and God will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. Let there be tears for what you've done. Let there be sorrow and deep grief. Let there be sadness instead of laughter and gloom instead of joy. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he'll lift you up in honor. Don't speak evil against each other, dear brothers and sisters. If you criticize and judge each other, then you're criticizing and judging God's law. But your job is to obey the law, not to judge whether it applies to you. God alone who gave the law is the judge who also has a power to save or destroy. See what you do. See what right do you have to judge your neighbor? Look, look, you who say today or tomorrow, we're going on a certain town and we'll stay there for a year. We'll do business and make profit. How do you know what your life will be like tomorrow? Your life is like the morning fog. It's here a little while, then it's gone. What have you ought to say is if the Lord wants us to, we will live and do this or that. Otherwise you're boasting about your own pretentious plan and all such boasting is evil. Remember, it is a sin to know what you ought to do and then not to do it. Wow. Remember, it is a sin to know what you ought to do and not do it. Okay. Look here, you rich people. Weep and groan with anguish because of all the terrible troubles ahead of you. Your wealth is rotting away and your fine clothes are moth-eaten rags. Your gold and silver are corroded. The very wealth you are counting on will eat, will eat away your flesh like fire. This corroded treasure you have hoarded will testify against you on the day of judgment. For listen, here cries the field workers whom you cheated on their pay. The cries of those who harvest your fields have reached the ears of the Lord of heaven armies. You spent your years on earth in luxury, satisfying your every desire. You fatten yourselves for the day of slaughter. You've condemned and killed the innocent people who do not resist you. Dear brothers and sisters, be patient as you wait for the Lord's return. Consider the farmers who patiently wait for the rains and fall to fall in the spring. They eagerly wait for the valuable harvest to ripen. You too must be patient. Take courage for the coming of the Lord's day is near. Don't grumble about each other, brothers and sisters, or you'll be judged. For look, the judge is standing at the door. For examples of patience is su in suffering. Dear brothers and sisters, look at the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. We give great honor to those who endure under suffering. For instance, you know about Job, a man of great endurance. You can see how the Lord was kind to him at the end of his full life of tenderness and mercy. But most of all, my brothers and sisters, never take an oath by heaven or on earth or anything else. Just say a simple yes or no so you'll not have to sin and be condemned. Are any of you suffering hardships? You should pray. Are any of you happy? You should sing praises. Are any of you sick? You should call the elders of the church to come and pray for you, anointing you with oil in the name of the Lord Jesus. Such a prayer offered in faith will heal the sick and the Lord will make you well. And for and if you have committed any sins, you will be forgiven. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. Elijah was a human as we are. And yet when he prayed earnestly that no rain would fall, none fell for three and a half years. And when he prayed again, the sky sent down and the earth began to yield its crops. My dear brothers and sisters, if someone among you wanders from the truth and is brought back, you can be sure that whoever brings a sinner back from wandering will, will save that person from death and bring about the forgiveness of many sins. All right, First Peter, here we go. About to hit the nine hour mark soon. A little quick stretch here. We are so close, guys. We're right there. Just got a couple more books and then Revelation. Oh, I was like, <laughs> there's no way we're going to go past eight hours. This is officially the longest I've ever streamed for sure. For sure. For sure. No doubt. Okay. Here we go. No more. Nope. No 15 minute breaks. We're going for it. We're going for it. We got to finish here. This letter is from Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. I'm writing to God's chosen people who are living as foreigners in the province of Pontus, Galatia, Cap 
Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. God the Father knew you and chose you long ago, and His Spirit made you holy. As a result, you have obeyed Him and have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. May God give you more and more grace and peace. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by His great mercy that we've been born again. Because God raised Jesus from the dead, now we live with great expectation. And we have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled beyond the reach of change and decay. And through your faith, God is protecting you by His power until you receive this salvation. Oops. Where did I? I lost it. Uh, okay. Who is ready to reveal in the last day for all to see. So be truly glad that there is a wonderful joy ahead, even though you must endure many trials for a little while. These trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold. Though your faith is far more precious than mere gold, so when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor to the day when Jesus Christ was revealed to the whole world. You love him even though you've never seen him. Though you do not see him now, you trust him and you rejoice with a glorious and expressible joy. The reward for trusting him will be the salvation of your souls. This salvation was something even the prophets wanted to know more about when they prophesied the gracious salvation prepared for you. They wondered what time or situation the spirit of Christ within them was talking about when they told him in advance about Christ's suffering and the great glory afterward. They were told that their message was not for themselves, but for you. And now this good news has been announced to you by those who preach in the power of the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. It's also so wonderful that even the angels were eagerly waiting for these things to happen. So prepare your minds for action and exercise self-control. Put all your hope in the gracious salvation that will come to you when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. So you must live as God's obedient children. Do not slip back in your old ways of living that only satisfy your desires. You didn't know any better then, but now you must be holy in everything you do just as God who chose you is holy. For the scripture says you must be holy because I'm holy. And remember, <clears throat> that the heavenly father to whom you pray has no favorites. He will judge, judge or reward you according to what you have done. So you must live in reverent fear of him during your time here as temporary residents. For you know that God had paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors and it's not paid with mere gold or silver which lose their value. It is the precious blood of Jesus Christ, the sinless, spotless uh, lamb of God. God chose him as your ransom long before the world began and now in the last days he's been revealed for your sake. Through Christ you have come to trust in God and you have placed your faith and hope in him because he has raised Christ from the dead and given him a great glory. You were cleansed from your sins when you obeyed the truth so now you must show sincere love to each other as brothers and sisters love each other with all of their heart. For you've been born again not to a life that will quickly end quickly end your new life will last forever because it comes from the eternal living word of God. As the scripture says People are like grass. Their beauty is like a flower in the field. The grass wither and the, uh, and the flower fades, but the word of God remains forever. And the word of the good news has been preached to you. So get rid of all evil behavior. Be done with all deceit, hypocrisy, jealousy, and all unkind speech. Like newborn babies, you must crave pure spiritual milk so that you will grow into a full experience of salvation. Cry out for this nourishment now that you have a taste of the Lord's kindness. You are coming to Christ, who is the living cornerstone of God's temple, who is rejected by people. He was chosen by God for great honor. And you're living stones that God is building up into a spiritual temple. What's more, you are as holy priest through the meditation of Jesus Christ. You offered spiritual sacrifices um, that please God. And the scripture said, I am placing the cornerstone in Jerusalem, chosen for great honor, and anyone who trusts in me will never be disgraced. Yes, you who trust him recognize the honor God has given him, but those who reject him, the stone that the builder rejected has now become the cornerstone. And... Sorry guys, if you see me grabbing, like holding my mouth, it's just because my bottom lip is all is all cut up from my braces. He is a stone that makes the people stumble and the rocks that make them fall. They stumble because they don't obey God's word and they meet the fate that was planned for them. But you're not like that. You're a chosen people. You're a royal priesthood, a holy nation. You are God's very possession. As a result, you can show the goodness that uh, you can show others the goodness of God. For the God called you to darkness into His wonderful light. Once you had no identity as people, now you're God's people. Once you received no mercy, now you receive God's mercy. Dear friends, I warn you as temporary residents and foreigners to keep away from the worldly desires that wage war against your very souls. Be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors. Then even after they accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your honorable behavior and they will give honor to God when he judges the world. For the Lord's sake, submit to all human authority, whether the king as head of state or the officials as he has appointed. For the king has sent them to punish those who do wrong and honor those who do right. It is God's will that you, you live honorable it is God's will that your honorable lives should silence those ignorant people who make foolish accusations against you. For you are free, yet you are God's slaves, so don't use your freedom as an excuse to do evil. Respect everyone and love the family of believers. Fear God and respect the king. You who are slaves must submit to your masters with all respect. Do what they tell you, not only if they are kind and reasonable, but if they are cruel. For God is pleased when we, the conscience of his will, and you patiently endure the unjust treatment. Of course, you get no credit of being patient if you're being beaten for doing wrong. But if you suffer for being good, endure patiently 
for God is pleased with you. For God calls you to do good, even if it means suffering, as Christ has suffered for you. Here's your example. You must follow in his steps. He never sinned, nor did he deceive anyone. He did not retaliate when he was insulted, nor threaten or revenge when he suffered. He left his case in the hands of God, who always judges fairly. He personally carried out our sins in his body on the cross, so that he can be dead to sin and believe for what is right. By his wounds you are healed. Once you were like sheep who wandered away, but now you have turned to the shepherd, the guardian of your soul. I thought there was only three. Okay. No, there's another one. Okay. First Peter 3. In the same way, wives, you must accept the authority of your husbands. Then, even if some refuse to obey the good news, your godly lives will speak to them without any words. They will be won over by observing your pure and reverent lives. Don't be concerned about the outward beauty of fancy hairstyles, expensive jewelry, or beautiful clothing. You should clothe yourselves instead with the beauty that comes from within, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is so precious to God. This is how the holy women of old made themselves beautiful. They put their trust in God and accepted authority of their husbands. For instance, Sarah obeyed her husband Abraham and called him her master. You are her daughter. Uh, you are her daughter when you do what is right, without fear of what your husband might do. In the same way, husbands, you must give honor to your wives. Treat your wife with understanding as you live together. She may be weaker than you are, but she is your equal partner in God's gift of new life. Treat her as you should do, as you should, so your prayers will not be hindered. Finally, all of you should be in one mind. Sympathize with each other. Love each other as brothers and sisters. Be tenderhearted in a humble attitude. Don't repay evil for evil. Don't retaliate with insults when people insult you. Instead, pay them back with a blessing. That is what God called you to do when he will grant you a blessing. For the scripture says, if you want to enjoy life and see many happy days, keep your tongue from speaking evil and your lips from telling lies. Turn away from evil and do good. Search the peace and work to maintain it. The eyes of the Lord watch those who do right and his ears are open to their prayers. But the Lord turns his faith face against those who do evil. Where are we? We are in 1 Peter 3. Now, who will want to harm you if you're eager to do good? But even if you suffer for doing what is right, God will reward you for it. So don't worry or be afraid of their threats. Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks about your hope as a believer, be ready to explain it. But do this in a gentle and respectful way. Keep your conscience clear. Then if people speak against you, they will be ashamed when they see a good life you live because you belong to Christ. Remember, it is better to suffer for doing good for it is what God wants than to suffer for doing wrong. Christ suffered for our sins once and for all. He never sinned, but he died for sinners to bring you safely home. He suffered physical death, but he was raised to life in the spirit. So he went and preached to the spirits in prison, those who disobeyed God long ago, and he waited patiently while Noah was building his boat. Only eight people were saved from drowning in that terrible flood. And the water is a picture of baptism, which now saves you not by removing the dirt from your body, but as a response to God from a clean conscience is effective because of the res resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now Christ has gone to heaven. He is seated in the place of honor next to God and all the angels and authorities and powers accept his authority. All right. Here we go. This is so long. We're almost at nine hours. Oh man, it just feels like time is moving so slow. It feels like we're moving so slow through this. <clears throat> okay. So then, since Christ suffered physical pain, you must arm yourselves with the same attitude he had and be ready to suffer too. For if you've suffered physically for Christ, you have finished with sin. You won't spend the rest of your lives chasing your own desires, but you'll be anxious to do the will of God. You've had enough in the past of these evil things that godless people enjoy. Their immorality and lust, their feasting and drunkenness and wild parties and their terrible worship idols. Of course, your former friends are surprised when you no longer plunge into the flood of wild and destructive things they do. So they slander you, but remember that they will have to face God who stands ready to judge everyone, both the living and the dead. That is why the good news was preached to those who are now dead. So although they were destined to die like all people, they now live forever with God in the spirit. The end of the world is coming soon. Therefore, be earnest and disciplined in your prayers. Prayers, most important of all, continue to show deep love for each other. For love covers a multitude of sin. Cheerfully share your home with those in need and a, or a place or and a, who need a meal or a place to stay. God has given each of you a gift from his variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve an, a one another. Do you have the gift of speaking? Then speak. Does, uh, as though God himself were speaking through you. Do you have the gift of helping others? Do it with all the strength and energy that God supplies. Then everything you do will bring glory to God through Christ Jesus. All glory and power to him forever and ever. Amen. Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery travels you're going through as if something strange were happening. Instead, be glad for these trials make you partners with Christ in his suffering so you have the wonderful joy of seeing his glory when it's revealed to the world. If you're insulted because you bear the name of Christ, you'll be blessed for the glory spirit of God rests upon you. If you suffer, however, it must not be for murder, stealing, and making trouble or prying into other people's affairs, but it's no shame to suffer for being a, a Christian. Praise God for the privilege of being called by his name. For the time has come for judgment and it must begin with God's household. And if judgment begins with us, what terrible weight of fate what terrible fate awaits those who have never obeyed God's good news. And also, if the righteous are barely saved, what will happen to the godless sinners? So if you're suffering in a manner that pleases God, keep on doing what is right and trust trust your lives to the God who created you, for he will never fail you. 
How many chapters does first Peter have? Okay. I, I was like, man. And now a word to you who are elders in the churches. I too am an elder and a witness to the sufferings of Christ. And I too will share in his glory when he's revealed to the whole world as a fellow elder. I appeal to you. Care for the flock that God has entrusted to you. Watch over it willingly, not grudgingly. Not for what you will get out of it, but because you're eager to serve God. Don't lord over the people assigned to you. Care, but lead them by the way of good example. And when the great shepherd appears, you will receive a crown of never-ending glory and honor. In the same way, you who are younger must accept the authority of the elders and all those who dress themselves in humility as it relates to one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So humble yourselves under the mighty power of God, and at the right time, he will lift you up in honor. Give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares about you. Stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Stand firm against him and be strong in your faith. Remember that your family of believers all over the world is going through the same kind of suffering you are. In his kindness, God called you to share in his eternal glory by means of Christ Jesus. So after you have suffered a little while, he will restore support and strengthen you and will place you on a firm foundation. All power to him forever. Amen. I have written and sent this short letter to you with the help of Silas, whom I commend you as a faithful brother. My purpose in writing is to encourage you and assure you that you are experiencing truly part of God's grace for you. Stand firm in this grace. Your sister church here in Babylon sends you greetings, and so does my son Mark. Greet each other with a kiss of love. Uh, peace be with all of you who are in Christ. All right. Second Peter. Here we go. Nine hour mark. We are at the nine hour mark. I cannot believe guys, I've been reading for nine hours out loud. This is absolutely crazy. <laughs> what is going on? Oh man, okay, here we go. Here we go, we got this. Listen, here's the thing guys, people think I'm dumb. Why do you do this, it's stupid. Why read the whole thing in one sitting? Why do you, like I had a lot of negative comments when I posted the flyer, which, is crazy to me like how could you be negative about reading the bible if one person finds our youtube video and sees it and is like this guy read for 10 hours then and they decide to read the bible and somehow either find god or get encouraged then to me it's worth it so that's my theory on it and that's what i'm sticking with second peter one this letter is from Simon Peter, a slave and apostle of Jesus Christ. I'm writing to you who share the same precious faith we have. This faith was given to you because of the justice and fairness of Jesus Christ, our God and Savior. May God give you more and more grace and peace as you grow in knowledge of God and Jesus, our Lord. By his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. We have received all of this by coming to know him and the one who called us to himself by means of his marvelous grace and excellence. And because of his glory and excellence, he has given us a great and precious promise. These are the promises that enable you to share his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. In view of all of this, make every effort to respond to God's promise, supplement your faith with a generous provision of moral excellence, and the moral excellence with knowledge, and with uh, knowledge with self-control, and self-control with patient endurance, and patient endurance with godliness. And with godliness, brotherly affection, and brotherly affection and love for everyone. The more you grow like this, the more you're the more productive and useful you will be in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But those who fail to develop in this, they are short-sighted or blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their old sins. So dear brothers and sisters, work hard to prove that you're really among those God has called and chosen. Do these things and you'll never fall away. Then God will give you a grand entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That's like one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible. Therefore, I'll always remind you about these things, even though you already know them and are standing firm in the faith and the truth you've been taught. And it's only a fight that I should keep on reminding you as long as I live, for our Lord Jesus Christ has shown me that I must soon leave this earthly life. So I work hard to work always, so I will work hard to make sure you always remember these things after I'm gone. For we are not making up clever stories when we told you about the powerful coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We saw his majestic splendor with our own eyes. When we received honor and glory from God the Father, the voice from the majestic glory of God said to him, This is my dearly beloved son, and he brings me great joy. We ourselves heard that voice from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. Because of that experience, we have even greater confidence in the message proclaimed by the prophets. You must pay close attention to what they wrote, for their words are like a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and Christ. Christ, the morning star, shines in your heart. Above all, you must realize that no prophecy in scripture ever came from a prophet's own understanding or human initiative. No, these prophets were moved by the Holy Spirit and they spoke from God. But there were also, oh, another long one here. Okay, we got this, guys. <laughs> 
But they were also false prophets in Israel, just that they will be false teachers among you. They will cleverly teach destructive heresies and even deny the master who brought them in. In this way, they will bring sudden destruction on themselves. Many will follow their evil teachings and shameful immorality. And because of these teachers, the way of truth will be slandered. In their greed, they'll make up clever lies to get hold of your money. But but God condemned them long ago and their destruction will not be delayed. For God did not spare even the angels who sinned. He threw them into hell in a gloomy pit of darkness where they will be held until judgment day. And God did not spare the ancient world except for Noah and seven others. Noah warned the word the world of God's righteous judgment. So God protected Noah when he destroyed the world of ungodly people with a vast flood. Later, God condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and turned them into heaps of ashes. He made them an example of what will happen to ungodly people. But also God rescued Lot of Sodom and because he was a righteous man who was sick of the shameful immorality of the wicked people around him. A lot of words here. Yes, Lot was a righteous man who was tormented in his soul by the wickedness he saw and heard day after day. So you see, the Lord knows how to rescue godly people from their trials and even while keep the wicked under punishment until the day of final judgment. He is especially hard on those who follow their own twisted sexual desires and despise authority. These people are proud and arrogant and daring even to scoff at supernatural beings without so much as trembling. But the angels who are far greater in power and strength do not dare to bring from the Lord a charge of blasphemy against spiritual beings, supernatural beings. These false teachers are like unthinking animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed. They scoff at things they don't understand, and they're like wild animals. They will be destroyed. Their destruction is their reward for the harm they've done. They love to indulge in evil pleasures in broad daylight. They are disgrace and they strain among you. They delight in deception even as they eat with you in your fellowship meals. They commit adultery with their eyes, and their desire for sin is never satisfied. They lure unstable people into sin, and they, and they are well-trained in greed. They live under God's curse. They have wandered off the right and followed the footsteps of Balaam, son of Beor, who, f who loved to earn money by doing wrong. But Balaam was stopped from his mad course when the donkey rebuked him with a human voice. These people are useless as dried up springs or as mist blown about by the wind. They are doomed for the blackest darkness. They brag about themselves with empty foolish boasting, with an appeal to twisted sexual desires. They lure back into sin those who have barely escaped from a lifestyle of deception. They promise freedom, but they themselves are slaves of sin and corruption, for you are slave to whatever controls you. And when they escape, he escape from the wickedness of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they then get tangled up and ensla enslaved by sin again. They are worse off than before. It would be better if they never knew the way of righteousness and to know it and then to reject the command to live a holy life. They prove the truth of this proverb. A dog returns to a vomit and another uh, says a pig uh, return, a pig, a washed pig returns to the mud. This is my second letter to you, dear friends. And in both of them, I try to stimulate your wholesome thinking and refresh your memory. I want you to remember what the Holy Prophet said long ago and your Lord and Savior commanded through your apostles. Most importantly, I want to remind you that in the last days, scoffers will come mocking the truth of the fault and following their own desires. They will say, what happened to the promise of Jesus coming? From the times of our ancestors, everything has been the same since the world was first created. They deliberately, they deliberately forget that God made the heavens long ago by his word and command, and he brought the earth out from the water and surrounded it with water. Then he used the water to destroy the ancient world with a with a mighty flood, and by the same word he to present and by the same word the present heavens and earth have been stored up for fire. They are being kept for the day of judgment when ungodly people will be destroyed. But you must not forget this one thing, dear friends: a day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years like a day. The Lord isn't really slow about his promise, as some people think. No, he's being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. But the day of the Lord will come unexpectedly as a thief. Then the heavens will pass away in a terrible noise and the very elements will disappear in fire and the earth and everything in it will be found to deserve judgment. Since everything around us is going to be destroyed like this, what holy and godly lives you should live looking forward to the day of God and hurrying it along on that day. He will set fire to the heavens and the elements will melt away in flames. But we are looking forward to the new heavens and the new earth. He has promised a world filled with God's righteousness. And so, dear friends, while you're waiting for these things to happen, make every effort to be found living a peaceful, pure, and blameless in his sight. And remember, our Lord's patience gives people time to be saved. This is what our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you with the wisdom God gave him. Speaking of these things in all of his letters, some of his comments are hard to understand, and those who are ignorant and unstable have twisted his letters to mean something quite different, just as they do with other parts of scripture, and in the result, and and this will result in destruction. Uh, my eyeballs, my eyeballs, my eyeballs are getting all, getting all weird. Okay, we got this. You already know these things, dear friends. So be on guard and you will not be carried away by the errors of these wicked people and lose your own secure footing. Rather, you must grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. All glory to him both now, forever and ever. Amen. All right, we're getting there. We're getting there. I'm using NLT. New Living Translation.
All right, First John 1. We proclaim to you the one who existed from the beginning, whom we have heard and seen. We saw him with our own eyes and touched him with our own hands. He is the word of life, this one who is life itself was revealed to us, and we have seen him. And now we testify and proclaim to you that he is the one who has eternal life. He is with the Father, and he was revealed to us. We proclaim to you what we ourselves actually seen and heard, so that you might have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with Father and his Son, Christ, uh, Son Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that you may fully share our joy. This is the message we heard from Jesus and now declare to you, God is light and there is no darkness in him. So we are lying if we say we have fellowship with God, but go on, excuse me, living in spiritual darkness. We are not practicing the truth, but if we are living in the light as God is in the light, then we have fellowship with each other and the blood of Jesus, his son cleanses us from sins. If we claim we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. If we claim we have not sinned, we are calling God a liar and we are showing that his word has no place in our hearts. Chapter two, dear children, I'm writing to you this so that you'll not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate who pleads our case before the father. He is Jesus Christ, the one who is truly righteous. He himself is a sacrifice that atones for our sins and not only for our sins, but the sins of the world. And we can be sure that we know him if we obey his commandments. If someone claims I know God, but doesn't obey God's commandments, that person is a liar and not living in the truth. But those who obey God's word truly show how completely they love him. That is how we know we are living in him. Those who say they live in God live their li should live their lives as Jesus did. Dear brothers, or I'm sorry, dear friends, I am not writing a new commandment for you. Rather, it is an old one for we you have heard from the beginning. This is this old commandment to love one another it is the same message you heard before yet it is also new jesus lived the truth of this commandment and you also are living it for the darkness is disappearing and the true light is already shining if anyone claims i'm living in the light but he hates a fellow believer the person is still living in darkness anyone who loves a fellow believer is living in the light and does not cause others to stumble but anyone who hates a fellow believer is still living and walking in darkness such a person does not know the way of god and has been an way to go having been blinded by the darkness I'm writing to you because you are God's children, because your sins have been forgiven through Jesus. I'm writing to you who are mature in the faith because you know Christ who existed from the beginning. I'm writing to you who are young in the faith because you have won the battle with the evil one. I'm writing to you who are God's children because you know the Father. Excuse me. I'm writing to you who are mature in the faith because you know Christ who existed from the beginning. I am writing to you who are young in the faith because you are strong. God's word lives in your hearts and you have won the battle with the evil one. Do not love this world, nor the things the world has to offer. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. For the love of the world, for the love, for the, <laughs> for the world only offers a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see and pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but they are from the world. And this world is fading away along with everything that people crave. But anyone who does, who does please God will live forever. Dear children, the last hour is here. You have heard the Antichrist is coming, and already many such Antichrists have appeared. From this we know that the last hour has come. These people left our churches, but they never really belonged with us. Otherwise, they would have stayed with us when they left. It proved they did not belong with us. But you are not like that, for the Holy One is giving you the, the Spirit, and all of you know the truth. So I'm writing to you not because you don't know the truth, but because you know the difference between truth and lies. And who is a liar? Anyone who says that Jesus is not the Christ, anyone who denies the Father and the Son is an antichrist. Anyone who denies the Son doesn't have the Father either, but anyone who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. So you must remain faithful to what you've been taught from the beginning. If you do remain in fellowship with the Son and with the Father, and this fellowship will give it uh, will enjoy the eternal life you promised us. I'm writing these things to warn you about those who want to lead you astray, but you have received the Holy Spirit and he lives within you, so you might not need anyone to teach you what is true. For the Spirit teaches you everything you need to know and what the Spirit teaches is true. It's not a lie. So just as he taught you, remain in fellowship with Christ. All right, here we go. And now, dear children, remain in fellowship with Christ so that when he returns, you'll be full of courage and not shrink back from him in shame. Since we know that Christ is righteous, we also know that he will do what is right we are God's children. How many chapters in 1 John? I thought 1 John was short. <laughs> See how very much our Father loves us, for he calls us his children, and that is what we are. But the people who belong to this world don't recognize that we are God's children because they don't know him. Dear friends, we are already God's children, but he has not yet shown us what we will be like in Christ appears. But we do know what we will be like for him. We will see him... <laughs> Hold on, I lost myself. For we'll see him as he really is. And all who have his eager expectation will keep themselves pure just as he is pure. Everyone who sins is breaking God's law for all sin is contrary to the law of God. And you know that Jesus came to take away our sins and there's no sin in him. 
Anyone who continues to live in him will not sin, but anyone who keeps sinning on does not know or understand who he is. Dear children, don't let anyone deceive you about this. When people do what is right, it shows that they are righteous, even as Christ is righteous. But when people keep on sinning, it shows that they belong to the devil who has been sinning since the beginning. But the Son of Man, the Son of God, came to destroy the works of the devil. Those who have been born into God's family do not make a practice of sinning because God's life is in them. So they can't keep on sinning because they're children of God. So now we can tell who you are, children of God and or children of the devil. Anyone who does not live righteously and does not follow other believers does not belong to God. This is the message you have heard from the beginning. Excuse me. This is the message you heard from the beginning. You should love one another and we must not be like Cain who belonged to the evil one and killed his brother. And why did he kill him? Because Cain had been doing what was evil and his brother had been doing what was righteous. So don't be surprised, dear brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. If we love our brothers and sisters who are believers, it proves that we have passed from death to life. But a person who has no love is still dead. Anyone who hates another as brother or sister is really a murderer at heart. And you know that murderers don't have eternal life within them. We know what real love is because Jesus gave his life for us, so we also to give up our lives to our brothers and sisters. If someone has enough money to live well and see a brother or sister in need, but shows no compassion, how could God's love be in that person? Dear children, let's not merely say that we love each other. Let us show the truth by our actions. Our actions will show that we belong to the truth, so we'll be confident when we stand before God. Even if we feel guilty, God is greater than our feelings and he knows everything. Dear friends, if we don't feel guilty, we can come to God with bold confidence and we will receive from him whatever we ask um we obey him and do the things that please him and this commandment we must believe in the name and this is his commandment we must believe in the name of his son jesus christ and love one another just as the commanded us those who obey god's commandments remain in fellowship with him and he with them and we know he lives in us because the spirit he gives lives in us how many chapters does first john have what more dear friends do not believe everyone who claims to speak by the spirit you must test to see if the spirit they have comes from God. For there are many false prophets in the world. Those who know who they are have the spirit of God. If a person claiming to be a prophet acknowledges that Jesus came in a real body, that person has the spirit of God. But if someone claims to be a prophet and does not acknowledge the truth about Jesus, that person is not from God. Such a person has the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard is coming into the world and indeed is already here. But you belong to God, my dear children. You have already won a victory over those people because the spirit lives in you is greater than the spirit that lives in the world. Those who belong to the world, so they speak from the world's viewpoint and the world listens to them but we belong to god and those who know god listen to us if they do not belong to god they don't listen to us that is how we know if someone has the spirit of truth or spirit of deception dear friends let us continue to love one another for the love comes from god anyone who loves is a child of god and knows god but anyone who does not love does not does not know god for god is love God showed how much he loved us by sending his only son into the world that he might have eternal life through him. This is real love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Dear friends, since God loved us so much, we surely ought to love each other. No one has ever seen God, but if we love each other, God lives in us and his love is brought to full expression in us. And God has given us his spirit, so, spirit as proof that we live in him and he in us. Furthermore, we have seen him with our own eyes and testify that the father has sent his son to be the savior of the world. All who declare that Jesus is the Son of God have God living in them, and they live in God. We know how much God loves us, and we put our trust in Him. God is love, and all who love in love... Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> God is love, and all who live in love live in God, and God lives in them. And as we live in God, our love grows more perfect, so we will not be afraid of the day of judgment, but we can face Him with confidence because we live like Jesus in this world. Such love has no fear because perfect love expels all fear. If we are afraid, it is the fear of punishment, and this shows that we have not fully experienced His perfect love. We, we love each other because He first loved us. If someone says, I love God, but hates His fellow brother, that person is a liar. For if we don't love people we can see, how can we love God who we can't see? And He has given us this command to love those. Uh, those who love God must also love their fellow believers, brothers. Okay. Everyone who believes that Jesus Christ has become a child, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has become a child of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves his children too. We know we love God's, lots of love here. We know we love God's children if we love and obey his commandments. Loving God means, keep, means keeping his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. For every child of God defeats this evil world, and we achieve this victory uh, through our faith. And who can win this battle against the world? Only those who believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And Jesus Christ was revealed as God's son by his baptism in water and by shedding his blood on the cross. Not by water only, but by water, but by water and blood and by the spirit who is truth confirms it with this testimony. So we have these three witnesses, the spirit, the water, and the blood, and they all agree. Since we believe in a human testimony, surely we can believe in a greater testimony that comes from God and God 
and God has testified about his son. All who believe in the son of God know in their heart that their testimony is true. Those who don't believe are actually calling God a liar because they don't believe that God testified about his son. And this is what God has testified. He has given us eternal life and this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son does not have life. If I've written you, if I've written this to you who believe in the name of the son of God so that you might know have eternal life and we are confident that that he who hears us whenever we ask anything pleases him and since we know he hears us when we make our requests we also know that he'll give us what we ask for if we see a fellow believer in sinning in a way that does not lead to death you should pray that god will give the person life but if there is sin that leads to death i'm not saying you should pray for those who commit it all wicked actions are sin but not every sin leads to death wow that's interesting We know that God's children do not make a practice of sinning, for God's Son holds them securely, and the evil one cannot touch them. We know that we are children of God, and that the world around us is under the control of the evil one. We know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we can know the true God, and know we live in fellowship with the true God, because we live in fellowship with the Son, Jesus Christ. He is the only true God, and He and He is eternal life. Dear children, you must uh, keep away from anything that might take God's place in your hearts. All right, we are on 2 John. Second John. Here we go. We got this, guys. I'm tell I'm I'm preaching to myself here. Okay, so we have three really short books and then we're starting Revelation. Thank you, Lord. This letter is from John the Elder. I'm writing to the chosen lady. Um the chosen lady and her children whom I love in the truth, as does everyone else who knows the truth, because the truth lives in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace, which comes from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, will continue to be with those in truth and love. How happy I was to meet some of your children and find them living according to the truth, just as the Father commanded. I'm writing to remind you, dear friends, that we should love one another. This is not a new commandment, but one we've had from the beginning. Love means doing what God has commanded us, and he commanded us to love one another, just as you heard from the beginning. I say this because many deceivers have gone into the world, and they deny that Jesus Christ came in a real body. Such a person is a deceiver and an antichrist. Watch out for those who do not lose what we have worked. Watch out that you do not lose what we have worked so hard to achieve. Be diligent so that you receive your full reward. Anyone who wanders from this teaching has no relationship with God, but anyone who remains in this teaching of Christ has a relationship with both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to your meeting and does not teach the truth about Christ, don't invite the person in your home or give them encouragement. Anyone who encourages such people becomes a partner in their evil work. I have much more to say, but I don't want to do it with paper and ink, for I hope to visit you soon and talk with you face to face. Then your joy will be complete. Greetings from the children chosen by God. Okay. Thank you, John. We are on third John now. This letter is from John the Elder. I'm writing to Gaius, my friend whom I love in the truth. Dear friend, I hope all is well with you and that you're healthy in body as you are strong in spirit. Some of the traveling teachers recently returned and made me very happy by telling me about your faithfulness and that you're living according to the truth. I could have no greater joy than to hear my children are following the truth. Dear friends, you're being uh, faithful to God when you care about the traveling teachers who pass through. Even though they're strangers to you, they have told you the church here for your loving friendship. Please continue providing such teachers in a manner that pleases God. They are traveling for the Lord and they accept nothing from people who are not believers. So we ourselves should support them as as we can be their partners as they teach the truth. I wrote to the church about this, but Diot... By, but Diotrephus, who loves to be the leader, refuses to have anything to do with us. When I come, these guys are always talking about each other. I love it. Paul's always like, this person did this. When I come, I will report some of this, some of the things he is doing and the evil accusations he's making against us. Not only does he refuse to welcome the traveling teachers, he also tells others to not help them. And when they do help, he puts them out of the church. I know some pastors like that. They hate when traveling preachers come into town or come into their church. Dear friend, don't let this bad example influence you. Follow only what is good. Remember that those who do, who prove that they are God's children and those who do evil prove they don't know God. Everyone who speaks highly of Demetrius, as does the truth itself, we ourselves can say the same for him and we know we speak the truth. I have much more to say to you, but I don't want to write it with a pen and ink for I hope to see you soon and then we'll talk face to face. Peace be with you. Your friends are here. Your friends here send their greetings. Please give my personal greetings to each of our friends there. All right, here we go. Here we go. This letter is from Jude, a slave of Jesus Christ and brother of James. I'm writing to all of you who have been called by God, the Father who loves and keeps safe care of Christ, uh, safe in the care of Jesus Christ. May God give you more and more peace, <laughs> more mercy, peace, and love. Dear friends, I've been eagerly planning to write you about the salvation we all share, but now I found that I must write about something else, urging you to defend the faith that God entrusted you once to his holy people. I say this because some ungodly people have wormed their way into your churches, saying that God's marvelous grace allows us to live immoral lives. The condemnation of such people was recorded long ago, for they have denied our only master, 
and Lord Jesus Christ. So I want to remind you, though you already know these things, that Jesus first rescued the nation of Israel for Egypt, but he later destroyed those who did not remain faithful. And I remind you of the angels who did not stay within the limits of authority God gave them, but left the place where, where they belonged. God also kept them securely chained in prisons of darkness, waiting for the great day of judgment. And don't forget Sodom and Gomorrah and their neighboring towns, which were filled with immorality and every kind of sexual perversion. Those cities were destroyed by fire and serve as a warning of the eternal fire of God's judgment. In the same way, these people who claim authority from their dreams live immoral lives, defy authority, and scoff at supernatural beings. But even Michael, one of the mightiest of the angels, did not dare accuse the devil of blasphemy, but simply said, the Lord rebukes you. This took place when Michael was arguing with the devil about Moses' body. But these people scoff at these things they don't understand. Like unthinking animals, they do whatever their instincts tell them, and they bring about their own destruction. What sorrow awaits them, for they follow in the footsteps of Cain, who killed his brother like Balaam. They deceive people for money. Like Korah, they perish in their rebellion. When these people eat with you in their fellowship mills, commemorating the Lord's love, they are like dangerous reefs that can shipwreck you. They are like shameless shepherds who only care for themselves. They are like clouds blowing over the land without giving any rain. They are like trees in the autumn that are dowly dead, for they bear no fruit and have not been pulled up by the roots. They are like wild waves of the sea churning up the foam of their shameful deeds. They are like wandering stars doomed forever to the blackest darkness. Enoch, who lived in the seventh generation after Adam, prophesied about these people. He said, listen, the Lord is coming with countless thousands of holy ones to execute judgment on the people of the world. He will convict every person of all the ungodly things they have done and for the insults of the ungodly sinners have spoken against them. These people are gamblers and I'm sorry, gamblers. These people are grumblers and complainers living only to satisfy their desires. They, be, they brag loudly about themselves and they flatter others to get what they want. But you, my dear friends, must remain. You must remain what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ predicted that they told that ugh, they told you that in the last times there would be scoffers of those who purpose whose purpose in life is to s satisfy their ungodly desires these people who are the ones who are creating divisions among you they follow their natural instincts because they don't follow don't have god's spirit in them but you dear friends must build each other up in your most holy faith pray in the power of the holy spirit and wait the mercy of the lord jesus christ who will bring you eternal life in this way you'll keep yourselves in god's love and you must show mercy to those whose faith is wavering rescue others by snatching them from the flames of judgment showing mercy to still others but do so with great caution hating the sins that contaminate their lives now all glory to god who is able to keep you from falling away will bring you great joy in his glorious presence without a single fall all glory to him who is alone uh, I just lost my place. All glory to him who alone is God, our Savior through Christ Jesus, our Lord. All glory, majesty, power, and authority. He before all time, in the present, and beyond all time. Amen. Oh, okay. Revelation is that. Look at It's right there. Revelation chapter 1. Nine hours and 25 minutes. Let me post, because we did have a new link. Let me just post for everyone on Instagram to join us for this very end here. Thank you for all that are here. There's 1,700 of you right now total. Let's just post something here. Let's see. Let me just post this new link. All right. I feel like I already feel like we've like accomplished so much by getting to Revelation because there's no going back now. Before I was like two hours and three hours. I was like, oh, I hope I can do this and make this. Now, there's no going back. There's no going back. We're here. We're at Revelation. This is the grand finale of this entire day it was light outside now it's dark it was 11 a.m and it's 8 30 p.m right now so here we go i need like some rocky music or something to play all right let me just take a quick break stretch really quick because i'm all like Ugh. here we are All right, I love this book. So this is like, not that I don't love the other books, but some of those smaller books were like, all right, can we get to Revelation now? All right, here we go. Here we go. The longest stream I've ever done by far. And this is it. We're, we're, we're going. We're going here. All right. Here we go.
All right. Here we go. Book of Revelation. Oh, man. <sighs> okay. I thought for sure we'd get this by eight hours, guys. I'm so off. I'm so off. We are nine and a half hours in with two 10 minute breaks today. And I've eaten one sandwich so far and five bites of oatmeal. This is the home stretch. Here we are, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you guys have been encouraged. I hope this has encouraged somebody watching this to read the Bible, really. And I mean, if you've been here the whole time, you actually just got the whole pretty much New Testament, except for, you know, we started in John, but you got a gospel plus the whole New Testament today. I'll eat after, I'll eat something after. We gotta get through this, it's already 8.30 p.m. My lip is so cut up from my braces, I forgot to put on the little wax and that was a big mistake, but it's okay. All right, here we go. Let me just make sure that I post it here. Oops. Oops, the daisies. All right, here we go. Let's do it. Nine and a half hours. I'm all stretched. I drank water. Those of you, might, it's the middle of the night for you. All right, here we go. Revelation, here we are. Revelation chapter one. This is a revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show his servants the events that must soon take place. He sent an angel to present this revelation to a servant, John, who faithfully reported everything he saw. This is his report of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. God blesses those who reads the word of this prophecy to the church, and he blesses all who listen to its message and obey what it says for the time is near. Let me read that one more time for all of us tonight. God blesses those who reads the word, who read the words of this prophecy to the church, and he blesses all who listen to its message and obey what it says. This is the only book in the Bible that promises a blessing if you read it or if you receive it. This letter is from John to the seven churches in the province of Asia. Grace and peace to you, grace and peace to you from the one who is, who always was, and is always to come, from the sevenfold, sevenfold spirit before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, he is faithful witness to these things the first to rise from the dead and the ruler of all the kings of the world. All glory to him who loves us and has freed us from the from sins by shedding his blood for us. He has made us a kingdom of priests for God his father. All glory and power to him forever and ever. Amen. Look, here comes with the here he comes with the cloud of heavens and everyone will see him and those who pierced him and all the nations of the world will mourn for him. Yes, amen. I am the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord God. I am the one who is and always was and who is still to come, the almighty one. I, John, am your brother and your partner in suffering and in God's kingdom and in the patient endurance to which Jesus called us. I was exiled to the island of Patmos for preaching the word of God and for my testimony about Jesus. Excuse me. It was the Lord's day and I was worshiping in the spirit and suddenly I heard a, 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 I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet blast. It said, write in a book everything you see and send it to the seven churches in the cities of Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Okay, I can pronounce those because I preached on those so much. When I turned to see who was speaking to me, I saw seven gold lampstands and standing in the middle of the lampstands was someone like the son of man. He was wearing a long robe with a gold sash across his chest. His head and hair were like white as wool and white as snow, and his eyes were like flames of fire. His feet were like polished bronze refined in a furnace, and his voice thundered like a mighty ocean waves. He held seven stars in his right hand, and a sharp two-edged sword came from his mouth, and his face was like the sun with all its brilliance. And then I saw him, and I fell at his feet as if I were dead, but he laid his right hand on me and said, Don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I died, but look. I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and the grave. Write down what you have seen, both the things that are now happening and the things that will happen. This is the meaning of the mystery of the seven stars you saw in my right hand, and the seven gold lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven gold lampstands are the seven churches. All right, you, there we go. Chapter two. Write this letter to the angel of the church in Ephesus. This is the message from the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven lampstands. And by the way, the orange is red in actual Bibles. It's just because it's on night mode, it's orange. So anything in orange is the words of Jesus. I know all the things you do. I've seen your hard work and your patient endurance. I know that you don't tolerate evil people. You've examined the claims of those who say they are apostles but are not, and you've discovered they are liars. You have patiently suffered for me without quitting. But I have this complaint against you. You don't love me or each other as you did at first. Look how far you've fallen. Turn back to me and do the works you did at first. If you don't repent, I will come and remove your lampstand from its place among the churches. 
but this is in your favor. You hate the evil deeds of the Nicolaitans just as I do. Anyone with ears, let him hear. Anyone with ears must listen to what the Spirit and understand what He's saying to the churches. To everyone who is victorious, I will give him fruit from the tree of life in the paradise of God. Write this letter to the angel of the church of Smyrna. This is the message from the one who is the first and the last, who is dead but is now alive. I know about your suffering and your poverty, but you are rich. I know the blasphemy of those opposing you. They say they are Jews, but they are not, because their synagogue belongs to Satan. Don't be afraid for what you're about to suffer. The devil will throw some of you into prison to test you. You will suffer for 10 days, but if you remain faithful, even when facing death, I will give you the crown of life. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the spirit and understand what he's saying to the churches. Whoever is victorious will not be harmed by the second death. Write this letter to the angel of the church of Pergamum. This is the message from the one with the sharp two-edged sword. I know that you live in a city where Satan has his throne, yet you've remained loyal to me. You've refused to deny, de, ugh, deny me even when Antipas, my faithful witness, was martyred among you there in Satan's city. But I have a few complaints against you. You tolerate some whose teaching is like that of Balaam, who showed Balak how to trip up the people of Israel. He taught them to commit sins by eating food offered to idols and committing sexual sin. In a similar way, you have some Nicolaitans among you who follow the same teaching. Repent of your sin or I'll come to you <clears throat> suddenly and fight against you with the sword of my mouth. Anyone with ears must listen to the Spirit and understand what he's saying to the churches. That everyone who is victorious, I will give... Well, I will give some of the manna that has been hidden away in heaven, and I will give to each one a white stone, and on the stone will be engraved a new name that no one understands except the one that receives it. Write this letter to the angel of the church of Thyatira. This is a message from the Son of God, whose eyes are like flames of fire, whose feet are like polished bronze. I know all the things you do. I've seen your love, your faith, and your service, and your patient endurance. And I can see your constant improvement in all these things. But I have this complaint against you. You are permitting that woman, that Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet, to lead my servants astray. She teaches them to commit sexual sin and eat food offered to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she's not. But she does not want to turn from her immorality. Therefore, I will throw her on a bed of suffering, and those who commit adultery with her will suffer greatly unless they repent and turn away from their evil deeds. I will strike her children dead, and all the churches will know that I am the one who searches out the thoughts and intentions of every person, and I will give each of you whatever you deserve. But also, I have this message for the rest of you in Thyatira, who have not followed this false teaching, deeper truths as they call them, the depths of Satan actually. I will ask nothing more of you except that you hold tightly to what you have until I come. To all who are victorious to obey me to the very end, to them I will give authority over the nations. They will rule the nations with an iron rod and smash them like clay pots. They will have the same authority I receive from my Father and also give them the morning star. Anyone with ears must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. Chapter 3. Write this letter to the angel of the church in Sardis. This is the message from the one who has sevenfold spirits of God and the seven, uh, seven stars. I know all the things you do, that you have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up, strengthen what little remains, for even what is left is almost dead. I find that your actions do not meet the requirements of my God. Go back to what you did and heard and believed at first. Hold firmly to it. Repent and turn to me again. If you don't wake up, I will come suddenly and unexpectedly as a thief. Yet there are some in the church of Sardis who, do, who have not soiled their clothes with evil. They will walk... They walk with me in white, for they are worthy. All who are victorious will be clothed in white. I will never erase their names from the book of life, but I will announce before my Father and his angels that they are mine. Anyone with ears must listen to the Spirit and understand what he's saying to the churches. Write this letter to the church in Philadelphia. This is the message from the one who is holy and true, who has the key of David, and who opens no and what he opens no one can close and what he closes no one can open i know all these things that you do and i've opened a door for you that no one can close you have little strength yet you obeyed my word and did not deny me look i will force those who belong to satan's synagogue those liars who say they're jews but are not to come and bow down at your feet they will acknowledge that you are the ones i love because you have obeyed my command and preserve, I will protect you from the great time of testing that will come upon the whole world to, to test those who belong to this world. I'm coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. All who are victorious will become pillars in the temple of God and they will never, ever, ha uh, never have to leave it. And I will write their name on the name. I will write them ugh, and I will write on them the name of my God and they will be citizens in the city of my God and the new Jerusalem that comes down from heaven from my God, from my God and I will also write on them the new name. Anyone with ears... Let, uh, must listen to the spirit and understand what he's saying to the churches. Write this letter to the angel of the church in Laodicea. This is the message from the one who is a man, the faithful, the true witness, the beginning of God's new creation. I know all the things you do. You're neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were one or the other. But since you are lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. You say, I'm rich. I have everything I want. I don't need a thing. And you don't realize that you're wretched and you're miserable. You're poor, you're blind, and you're naked. So I advise you to buy gold from me. Uh, buy from me gold that has been purified by fire, then you'll be rich. Also buy white garments from me, so you'll not be ashamed by your nakedness. An ointment for your eyes, and you'll not be able to, uh, so you'll be able to see. 
I correct and disciple everyone I love. So be diligent and turn from your indifference. Look, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and open the door, I will come in and he will share a meal together as friends. Those who are victorious will sit with me in my throne just as I was victorious and sat with my father on his throne. Anyone with ears must listen to the spirit and understand what he's saying to the churches. By the way, guys, on my channel, I have every i teach every i have a series of every verse out of revelation explained so i literally go from revelation chapter one to the very end and i teach um everything in revelation on my channel i think it took us like four months to do that and the whole playlist is there if you're interested and you like some of the stuff you're like what do they mean i talk about what it means in my teaching chapter four then as i look i saw a door standing in heaven and the same voice i heard before spoke to me like a trumpet and said come up here i will show you what what must happen after this and instantly i was in the spirit and saw a throne in heaven and someone sitting on it the one sitting on the throne was as brilliant as gemstones like jasper and carnelian and the glow of an emerald circled his throne like a rainbow 24 elders were surrounded 24 uh i just lost it and was the spirit saw a throne 24 thrones surrounded him and 24 elders sat on them. They were all clothed in white and had gold crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and the, th and the rumble of thunder. And in front of the throne were seven torches with burning flames. This is the sevenfold, sevenfold spirit of God. In front of those thrones was a shiny sea of glass sparkling like crystal. In the center and around the throne were four living beings, each covered with eyes front and back. And the first of these beings was like a lion, the second was like an ox, the third a human head, and the fourth was like an eagle in flight. Each of the living beings had six wings, and their their six their wings were covered with eyes inside and out. Day and night, they kept on saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, the one who was and is and is still to come. Whenever the living whenever the living beings give glory and honor to God, the one sitting on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down and worship the one sitting on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever, and they lay their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, O Lord, our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and they existed before and you were pleased. Chapter 5. Then I saw a scroll in the right hand of one who was sitting on the throne. There was a writing on the inside and outside of the scroll, and it was sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel who shouted with a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals of the scroll and open it? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll and read it. Then I began to weep bitterly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll and read it. But one of the 24 elders said to me, Stop weeping. Look, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the heir of David's throne, has won the victory. He is worthy to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb that looked like it had been sla slaughtered. But it was now standing between the throne and the four living beings and among the 24 elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which represent the sevenfold spirits of God that is sent out into every part of the earth. He stepped forward and took the scroll from my right hand and the one sitting on the throne. When he took the scroll, the four living beings and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp and they held gold bowls with incense, which are prayers of God's people. And they sang a new song with these words. You are worthy to take the scroll. You break its seal and open it. For you were slaughtered and your blood has ransomed the people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have caused them to become a kingdom of priests for our God and they will reign on earth. Then I looked again and I heard the voices of thousands and millions of angels around the throne and the living beings and the elders. Then they sang in a mighty chorus, Worthy is a lamb who was slaughtered to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And then I heard every creature in heaven on earth and under the earth and in the sea they sang, Blessing and honor, glory and power belong to the one sitting on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. And the four living beings said, Amen, and the 24 elders fell down and worshiped the Lamb. Man, I feel emotional, y'all, while I'm reading this. Wow, that's so powerful. I love this book. Chapter 6. As I watched the Lamb broke the first of the seven seals on the scroll, then I heard one of the four living beings say with a loud uh, th voice like thunder, Come. I looked up and saw a white horse standing there. Its rider carried a bow and crown was placed on his head. He rode out to win many battles and gain the victory. When the lamb broke the second seal, I heard the second living be being saying, come. Then another horse appeared, a red one. Its rider was given a mighty sword and the authority to take peace from the earth. And there was a war and slaughter everywhere. This is speaking of the tribulation period now, if you, if you don't know much about the book of Revelation. When the lamb broke the third seal, I heard the third living being saying, come. I looked up and saw a black horse and its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice from among the four living beings say, a loaf of wheat bread or three loaves of barley will cost a day's pay and don't waste the olive oil and wine. Then the lamb broke the fourth seal. I heard the fourth living being say, come. I looked up and saw a horse whose color was pale green. Its rider was named death and it was given and it was and his companion was the grave these two were given the authority over one fourth of the earth to kill with sword and famine and disease and wild animals when the lamb broke the fifth seal i saw under the altar the souls of all who had been martyred for the word of god and for being faithful in their testimony 
Then they shouted to the Lord and said, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you judge the people who belong to this world and avenge our blood for what they've done to us? Then a white robe was given to each of them and they were told to rest a little longer until the full number of their brothers and sisters, their fellow servants of Jesus were to be martyred had joined them. I watched as a lamb broke the sixth seal and there was a great earthquake. The sun became as dark as a black cloth and the moon became red as blood. Then the stars of the sky fell to the earth like green figs falling from a tree shaken by a strong wind. The sky was rolled away like a scroll and all the mountains and islands were moved from their places. Then everyone, the kings of the earth, the rulers, the generals, the wealthy, the powerful, and every slave and free person, they hid themselves in the caves among the rocks and the mountains. And they cried to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of the one who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of wrath has come and who is able to survive number seven chapter seven then i saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth holding back the four winds so they did not blow on the earth or the sea or even on any tree and i saw another angel coming up from the east carrying the seal of the living god and he shouted those four angels who had been given the power to harm land and sea wait don't harm the land and sea or trees until we place the seal of God on the foreheads of the servants. And I heard how many were marked with the seal of God, 144,000 from the 12, from the tribes of Israel, 12,000 from each tribe. After this, I saw a vast crowd too great to count from every nation and tribe and people and language standing in front of the throne and before the lamb. They were clothed in white robes and they had palm branches in their hand and they were shouting with a great war, great roar. Salvation comes from our God who sits on the throne and from the lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the and around the elders and around the four living beings. And they fell before the throne with their face to the ground and they worshiped God and they sang, Amen, blessing and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and strength belong to our God forever and ever, amen. Then one of the 24 elders asked him, who are these who are clothed in white? Where did they come from? And I said to him, sir, you are the one who knows. Then he asked, then he said to me, these are the ones who died in the great tribulation. They have washed the robes in the blood of the lamb and, and made them white. This is why they stand in front of God's throne and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will give them shelter. They will never again be hungry or thirsty. They'll never be scorched by the heat of the sun for the lamb on the throne will be their shepherd. We will lead them to springs of life and water and will wipe away every tear from their eye. Chapter eight. I'm like a robot. Chapter eight. When the lamb broke the seventh seal on the scroll, there was a silence throughout heaven for about a half an hour. I saw the seven angels who stand before God and they were given seven trumpets. Then another angel with a gold incense burner came and stood at the altar and a great amount of incense was given and mixed with prayers of God's people as an offering on the gold altar before the throne. The smoke of the incense mixed with the prayers of the God's holy people ascended up to God from the altar where the angel had poured them out. Then the angel filled the incense burner with fire from the altar and threw it down upon the earth and thunder crashed lightning flash night lightning flash and there was a terrible earthquake when the seven angels with the seven trumpets prepared to blow their mighty blast then i'm sorry the first angel blew his trumpet and hail and fire mixed with blood were thrown down on the earth one third of the earth was set on fire and one third of the trees were burned and all the green grass was burned and all this stuff i'm saying guys is literally going to happen in the future this book of revelation is about future events that are going to happen so these are like literal events that are going to happen in the future they haven't passed they're not figurative they're, they're literal events then the second angel blew his trumpet and a great mountain of fire was thrown into the sea. One third of the water in the sea became blood. One third of the living, all things living in the sea died. And one third of all ships on the sea were destroyed. Then the third angel blew his trumpet and a great star fell from heaven, burning like a torch. It fell on one third of the rivers and the springs of water. The name of the star was bitterness. It made one third of the water bitter and many people died from drinking the bitter water. When the fourth angel blew his trumpet and one third of the sun was struck and one third of the moon and one third of the stars and they became dark and one third of the day was dark and also one third of the night. Then I looked and I heard a single eagle crying loudly as it flew through the air. Terror terror to all who belong to this world because of what will happen when the last three angels blow their trumpets i feel like i missed that before in the past an, an eagle then the fifth angel blew his trumpet and saw a star that had fallen to the earth from the sky and he was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit when he opened when he opened it smoke poured out as through a huge furnace and the sunlight and air turned dark from smoke then locusts came from the smoke and descended onto the earth and they were given power to sting like scorpions. They were told not to harm the grass or plants or trees, but only people who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. They were told to kill that, not to kill them, but to torture them for five months with pain, like the pain of a scorpion sting. In those days, people will seek death, but not find it. They will long to die, but death will flee for them. 
So for five months, nobody will die on the earth. The locusts looked like horses prepared for battle. They had what looked like gold crowns on their heads and their faces looked like humans. They had hair like women's hair and teeth like the teeth of a lion. They wore armor made of iron and their wings roared like an army of chariots rushing into battle. They had tails that stung like scorpions and for five months they had the power to torment people. Their king is the angel from the bottomless pit. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon and in Greek Apollyon, the destroyer. The first terrorist passed, but look, two more terrors are coming. Then the sixth angel blew his trumpet, and I heard a voice speaking from the four horns of the gold altar that stand in the presence of God. And the voice said to the sixth angel who held the trumpet, Release the four angels who are bound at the great Euphrates River. Then the four angels who had been prepared for this hour and day and month and year were turned loose to kill one third of all the people on the earth. I heard the size of their army, which was 200 million mounted troops. And in my vision, I saw horses and riders sitting on them. The riders were armor that is fiery red, dark blue, and yellow. The horses had head like, heads like lions. The fire and smoke and burning sulfur billowed out of their mouths. One third of all the people on the earth were killed by these three plagues, by the fire and the smoke and burning sulfur that came from the mouth of the horses. This is like no joke. Their power was in their mouth and in their tails, for their tails had heads like snakes with the power to injure people. But the people who did not die of these plagues still refused to repent of their evil deeds and turn to God. They counted to worship demon. They continued to worship demons and idols made of gold, silver, bronze, stone, and wood, idols that can neither see nor walk, and they did not repent of their murders or witchcraft or sexual immorality or their thefts. Chapter 10. Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven, surrounded by a cloud with a rainbow over his head. His face shone like the sun, and his feet were like pillars of fire. And in his hand was a small scroll that had been opened. He stood with his right hand um on the sea and his left foot on the land and he gave a great shout like a roar of a lion and when he shouted the seven thunders answered when this and when the seven thunders spoke i was about to write but i heard a voice from heaven saying keep secret what the seven thunders said and do not write them down wow i want to know what the seven thunder said verse five then the angel and I, angel i saw standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand over toward heaven he swore an oath on the name of the one who lives forever and ever who created the heavens and the earth and everything in them the earth and everything in it and the sea and everything in it he said there will be no more delay when the seventh angel blows his trumpet god's mysterious plan will be fulfilled it will happen just as it announced to the uh servants and the prophets then of then the voice from heaven spoke to me again go and take the open scroll from the hand of the angel who's standing on the sea and on the land so when I went to the angel and told him to give me the scroll, yes, take it and eat it. So he said, it will be bitter as honey in your mouth, but it'll turn sour in your stomach. So I took the small scroll in the hand of the angel and I ate it. It was sweet in my mouth, but when I swallowed it, it turned sour in my stomach. Then I was told you must prophesy again about many people's nations, languages, and kings. Chapter 11. Then I was given a measuring stick and I was told, go and measure the temple of the God and the altar and count the number of worshipers, but do not measure the outer courtyard for it has been turned over the na to the nations. They will trample the holy city for 42 months and I'll give power to my two witnesses and they will be clothed in burlap and they'll prophesy during those 1260 days. These two prophets are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of all the earth. If anyone tries to harm them, fire will flash out of their mouths and consume their enemies. This is how anyone who tries to harm them must die. For they have the power to shut the sky that no rain will fall for as long as they prophesy and they have the power to turn the rivers and oceans into blood so to, so to strike the earth with every plague as often as they wish when they complete their testimony the beast that comes up out of the bottomless pit will declare war against them and he will conquer them and kill them and their bodies will lie in the main street of jerusalem the city is figuratively called sodom and egypt the city where the Lord was crucified. And for three and a half days, all the people, tribes, languages, and nations will stare at their bodies, but no one will be allowed to bury them. All the people who belong to this world will gloat over them and give presents to each other to celebrate the death of the two prophets who had tormented them. But after three and a half days, God breathed life into them and stood them up, terror struck all who were staring at them. Then a loud voice from heaven called to the two prophets, come up here, and they rose to heaven in a cloud as their enemies watched. At the same time, there was a terrible earthquake that destroyed a tenth of the city. 7,000 people died in that earthquake and everyone was also terrified and gave glory to God. The second terrorist passed, but look, the third terror is coming quickly. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet and there were loud voices shouting in heaven. The world has now become the kingdom of our Lord and of our Christ and he'll reign forever and ever. Then the 24 elders sitting on the thrones before God fell on their faces to, to the ground and worshiped him. And they said, we give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, the one who was and is and always was. For now you have assumed your great power and have begun to reign. The nations were filled with wrath, but now the time of your wrath has come. It's time to judge the dead and reward your servants, the prophets, as well as your holy people and all who fear your name from the least to the greatest for it's time 
to destroy all who have caused destruction to the earth. Then in heaven, the temple of God was opened and the Ark of the Covenant could be seen inside the temple. Lightning flashed, thunder clashed, crashed and roared, and there was an earthquake and a terrible hailstorm. Chapter 12. Then I witnessed in heaven an event of great significance. I saw a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon beneath her feet and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant and she cried out because her labor pains and agony of giving birth. Then I witnessed in heaven another significant event. I saw a large red dragon with seven heads and 10 horns. With seven crowns on his head, his tail swept away one third of the stars in the sky and he threw them to the earth. He stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth, ready to devour her baby as soon as it was born. She gave birth to the son who was to rule the nations with an iron rod and her child was snatched away by the dragon and was caught up to God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where God prepared a place to care for her for 1260 days. Then there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and his angels. And the dragon lost the battle and he sent his angels forced out of heaven. This great dragon, the ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, the one deceiving the whole world, was thrown down to the earth with all his angels. Then I heard a loud voice shouting across heaven. It has come at last, salvation and power, and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of the brethren and his sister and his sisters had been thrown down to the earth. The one who accuses them day and night, they have been defeated by the blood of the lamb and by their testimony. And they did not love their lives so much as they were afraid to die. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who live in the heavens rejoice. But terror will come on the earth and the sea for the day, for the devil has come down to you in a great anger, knowing that he has little time. When the dragon realized that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. But she was given two wings like those of a great eagle so she could fly to the place prepared for her in the wilderness. There she would care for her protected, per, care for and protected from the dragon for a time and times half in a time. Then the dragon tried to drown the woman with the flood of waters that flowed from his mouth, but the earth helped her by opening its mouth and swallowing the river that gushed from the mouth of the dragon. And the dragon was angry at the woman and declared war against her and her children, all who keep God's commandments and maintain the testimony of Jesus. Then the dragon took his stand on the shore beside the sea. Chapter 12. Then I saw a beast rising out of the sea. It had seven heads and ten horns, with ten crowns on its horns, and written on each of its head were names that blaspheme God. This beast looked like a leopard, but it had the feet of a bear and the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave the beast his power and throne of great authority. I saw one of the heads of the beast seemed wounded beyond recovery, but the fatal wound was healed. The whole world marveled at this miraculous and gave allegiance to the beast. They worshiped the dragon for giving the beast such power, and they also worshiped the beast who is who is as great as the beast, they exclaimed, who is able to fight against him. Then the beast was allowed to speak great, great blasphemes against God, and he was also given authority to do whatever he wanted for 42 months. And when he spoke terrible words of blasphemy against God, slandering his name in his dwelling, that is those who dwell in heaven, and the beast was allowed to wage war against God's holy people and to conquer them. And he was given authority to rule over every tribe and people, language, and nation, and all the people who belong to God worship the beast. These are the ones whose names are not written in the book of life that belong to the lamb who were slaughtered before the world was made. Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. Anyone who is destined for prison should be should be taken to prison. Anyone who is destined to die with the sword will die to this, by the sword. This means God's holy people must endure persecution patiently and remain faithful. Then I saw another beast come up out of the earth. He had two horns like those of a lamb. But he spoke with the voice of a dragon. He exercised all authority over the first beast. And he required all of the earth and his people to worship the first beast. Whose fatal wound had been healed. And that's talking about the Antichrist. He did astounding miracles, even making fire flash down from heaven from the sky while everyone was watching. And with all the miracles he was allowed to perform on behalf of the first beast, he decide, deceived all the people who belonged to this world, who ordered the people to make a great statue of the first beast, who was fatally wounded and came back to life. He was then permitted to give life to the statue so that it could speak. Then the statue of the beast, which is the statue of the Antichrist, commanded that anyone refusing to worship it must die. He required everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to be giving a mark on the right hand or on the forehead. That's the mark of the beast. And no one could buy or sell anything without the mark, which was neither the name of the beast nor the number that represents his name. Wisdom is needed here. Let the one with understanding solve the meaning of the number of the beast, for it's, it's the number of a man. His number is 666. Chapter 14. Then I saw the lamb standing on Mount Zion, Zion with him, 144,000 who had his name and the father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a sound from heaven like the roar of a mighty ocean waves or the rolling loud thunder. It was like the sound of many harpists playing together. This great choir sang a wonderful new song in front of the throne of God. And before the four living beings and the 24 elders, no one could learn this song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. They have kept themselves as pure as virgins, following the lamb wherever he goes. They also have been purchased from among the people in the on the earth as special offering to God and of the lamb. They told no lies and they were without blame. 
And I saw another angel flying through the sky, carrying the eternal good news to proclaim to the people who belong to the world, to every nation, tongue, tribe, and language. Fear God, he shouted. Give glory to him, for a time has come when he will sit as a judge and worship him will be made, worship him who made the heavens and earth, the sea, and all the springs of the water. Then another angel followed him through the sky, shouting, Babylon has fallen, that great city has fallen, because she made all the nations of the world drink the wine of her passionate immorality. Then a third angel followed, shouting, Anyone who worships the beast and his statue or accepts his mark on the forehead or on the hand must drink the wine of God's anger. It has been poured out full strength into God's cup of wrath, and they will be tormented with burning fire and sulfur day and night in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb. The smoke of their torment will rise forever and ever, and they will have no relief day or night, and they... For they have worshipped the beast and his statue and have, have accepted the mark of his name. This means that God's holy people must endure persecution patiently, obeying his commands and maintaining their faith in Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Write this down. Blessed are those who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, the spirit, they are blessed indeed. For they will rest from their hard work, for their good deeds follow them. All right, harvest of the earth. Wow, we're about to hit 10 hours here. Then I saw a white cloud, and seated on the cloud was someone like the Son of Man. He had a gold crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Then another angel came from the temple and shouted to the one sitting on the cloud, Swing the sickle, for the time of harvest has come, and the earth is, um, the crop of the, on the earth is ripe. So the one sitting on the cloud swung the sickle over the earth, and the whole earth was harvested. After that, an angel came from the temple in heaven, also had a sharp sickle. Then another angel, excuse me, who had the power to destroy with fire, came from the altar. He shouted to the angel with the sharp sickle, Swing your sickle now to gather the clusters of grapes from the vines of the earth, for they are ripe for judgment. So the angel swung his sickle over the earth and loaded the grapes into the great winepress of God's wrath. The grapes were trampled in the winepress outside the city, and the blood flowed from the winepress in a stream of 180 miles long, as high as a horse's bridle. Then I saw in heaven, chapter 15, Another mar uh, marvelous event of great significance. Seven angels were holding the seven last plagues, which would bring God's final wrath to completion. I saw before me what seemed to be a glass mixed with fire, and on it stood all the people who had been victorious over the beast and his statue, and the number representing the name. They were all holding harps, and God had given them, and they were singing the song of Moses, the servant of God, the song of the Lamb. Great and marvelous are your works, O Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations, who will not fear you, Lord, and glorify your name. For you alone are holy, for the nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous deeds have been revealed. Then I looked and saw that in the temple in heaven God's tabernacle was thrown wide open. The seven angels who were holding, holding the seven plagues came out of the temple. They were clothed in spotless white linen with gold angels... Um, with gold sashes across their chest. Then one of the four living beings handed each of the seven angels a gold bowl filled with the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. The temple was filled with smoke and from God's glory and power, no one could enter the temple until the seven angels had completed pouring out the seven plagues. Chapter 16. Then I heard a mighty voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, go your way and pour out on the earth the seven bowls containing God's wrath. So the first angel left the temple and poured out his bowl on the earth and horrible malignant sores broke out on anyone who had the mark of the beast and worshiped the statue. Then the second angel poured out his bowl on the sea and it became like blood of the corpse and everything in the sea died. Then the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs and they became blood. And I heard the angel had authority over the water saying, you are just a holy one who is always and always was because you have sent these judgments since they shed the blood of your holy people and your prophets. You've given them the blood to drink. It is their just reward. 10 hours. Can we get a 10 in the chat? 10 hours. <laughs> wow. Honestly, if you told me that I could read out loud for 10 hours, I would have been like, no, I'm not doing it. But praise the Lord. Here we are. We're doing it. And we're, we're almost done. One stretch. Hold on and drink a water. <laughs> My body is like stiff. Oh, all right. Then the fourth angel poured out his soul, his soul, his bowl on the sun, causing it to scorch everyone with its fire. Everyone was burned by its blast of heat, and they cursed the name of God and had control over all these plagues. They did not repent of their sins and turn to God and give him glory. Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom was plunged into darkness. His subjects ground their teeth in anguish, and they cursed the God of heaven for their pains and sores, and did not repent of the evil deeds and turn to God. Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great Euphrates River, and it dried up so the kings from the east could march their armies towards the west without hindrance. And I, I saw three evil spirits that looked like frogs leaping from the mouth of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. So the dragon's the devil, the beast is Antichrist, and the false prophet is the advocate of the Antichrist. They are demonic spirits who work miracles and go out, all the rulers of the world, to gather 
uh, them for the battle against the Lord and the great judgment day on the God Almighty. Look, I come unexpectedly as a thief. Blessed are those who are watching for me who keep their clothing ready so they don't have to walk around naked and ashamed. And the demonic spirits gathered all the rulers and their armies to a place with Hebrew name Armageddon. Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a mighty shout came from the throne of the temple, saying, It is finished. Then the thunder crashed and rolled, and lightning flashed, and a great earthquake struck, the worst since, since, the worst since people were placed on the earth. The great city of Babylon was split into three sections, and the cities of many, excuse me, nations fell into heaps of rubble so god remembered the fall of babylon sin and he made her drink the cup that was filled with the wine of his fierce wrath and every island disappeared and all the mountains were leveled there was a terrible hailstorm and the hills weighing as much as 75 pounds fell from the sky onto people below they cursed god oh no no hiccups they cursed god because of the terrible plague of hailstorms chapter 17 one of the seven angels who had poured out the seven bowls came over and spoke to me. Come with me, he said. I will show you the judgment that is going to come on the great prostitute who rules over many waters. The kings of the world have committed adultery with her, and the people who belong to this world have been drunk by the wine of her immorality. So the angel took me in the spirit into the wilderness. There I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that had seven heads and ten horns, and blasphemy coming um, against God were written all over it. The woman wore purple and scarlet clothing and a beautiful jewelry made of gold and precious gems and pearls. In her hand, she held a, a gold goblet full of obscenities and impurities of her immorality. A mysterious name was written on her forehead, Babylon the Great, mother of all prostitutes and obscenities in the world. I could see that she was drunk, drunk with the blood of God's holy people who were witnesses for Jesus. I stared at her in complete amazement. Why are you so amazed? The angel asked. I will tell you the mystery of this woman and of the beast with seven heads and ten horns on which she sits. The beast you saw was once alive but isn't now and will soon come up out of the bottomless pit and go into eternal destruction. And the people who belong to this world whose names were not written in the book of life before the world was made will be amazed at the reappearance of this beast who had died. This calls for a mind with understanding the seven heads of the beast represent the seven hills where the woman rules. They all re also represent seven kings. Five kings who have already fallen, the sixth now reigns, and the seventh is yet to come but his reign will be brief the scarlet beast that was but is no longer is the eighth king he's the other seven too and he is headed for destruction the ten horns of the beast are the ten kings who have not yet risen to power they will be appointed to their kingdoms for one brief moment to reign with the beast they will all agree to give their power and authority together they will go to war against the lamb and the lamb will defeat them because he is the lord of lord and the king of kings and he has called and chosen faithful ones who will be with him then the angel said to me, the waters where the prostitute is ruling represent the masses of people of every nation and language. The scarlet beast and his ten horns all hate the prostitute. They will strip her naked and eat her flesh and burn her remains with fire. For God has put a plan into their minds, a plan that will carry out his purpose. They will agree to give her authority to the scarlet beast and so the words of God will be fulfilled. And this woman you saw in your vision represents the great city that rules over the kings of the world. Chapter 18. After all this, I saw an angel come down from heaven with great authority, and the earth grew bright with his splendor. He gave a mighty shout. Babylon has fallen. The great city has fallen. She has become home for demons. She has become a home for demons. She has a hideout for every foul spirit, a hideout for every foul, vult foul vulture, and every foul and dreadful animal. For all the nations have fallen because of the wine of her passionate immorality. The kings of the world have committed adultery with her. Because of her desires for extravagant luxury, the merchants of the world have grown rich. Then I heard another voice calling from heaven. Come away from her, my people. Do not take part in her sins, or you will be punished with her. For her sins are piled as high as heaven, the heavens, and God remembers her evil deeds due to her as she has done to others. Double her penalty for all the earth evil deeds. She brewed a cup of terror for others, so brewed twice as much for her. She glorifies herself and lived in luxury, so match it now with torment and sorrow. She boasted in her heart, I am the queen of my throne, I am no I am no helpless widow, and I have no reason to mourn. Therefore these plagues will overtake her in a single day, death and mourning and famine. She will be completely consumed by fire, and the Lord who judges her is mighty. And the kings of the world who committed adultery with her and enjoyed her great luxury will mourn for her as they see smoke rising from her charred remains. Again, I have an info on my channel on what all this means. They will stand at a distance, terrified by her great torment. They will cry out, how terrible, how terrible, O Babylon, O great city. In a single moment, God's judgment came upon you. The merchants of the world will weep and mourn for her, for there's no one left to buy her goods. She bought with great quantities of gold, silver, and jewels, and pearls, fine linen, purple silk, and scarlet cloth, things made of fragrant thigh and wood, ivory goods, and objects made of expensive wood and bronze, iron and marble. She also brought, she also bought cinnamon, spice, incense, myrrh, frankincense, wine, olive oil, fine flour, wheat, cattle, sheep, horses, wagons, and bodies, that is human slaves. The fancy things you love so much, 
are gone, they cry. All of our luxuries and splendors are gone forever, new, never, to, uh, never to be yours again. The merchants who became wealthy by selling her things will stand at a distance, terrified by her great torment. They will weep and cry out, how terrible, how terrible for the great city. She was clothed in the finest purple and scarlet linens, decked out with gold and precious stones and pearls. And in a single moment, all the wealth of the city is gone. And all the captains and the merchant ships and their passengers and sailors crews will stand at a distance. They will cry out as they watch the smoke ascend. And they'll say, where is another great city as this? And they will weep and throw dust on their heads and show grief and they will cry out, how terrible, how terrible for that great city. The ship owners became wealthy by transporting their great wealth on the seas. In a single moment, it's all gone. Rejoice over her, O heaven, and people of God and apostles and prophets, for the last God has judged her for your sakes. Then a mighty angel picked up a boulder the size of a, size of a huge millstone. He threw it in the ocean and shouted, just like this, the great city of Babylon will be thrown down in violence and will never be found again. The sound of harps, singers, flutes, and trumpets will never be heard. No craftsmen, no trades will ever be found. The sound of mill will never be heard again. The lights of the lamp will never shine. The happy voices of the brides and the grooms will never be heard. For your merchants were the greatest in the world, and you deceived the nations with your sorceries. In your streets flowed the blood of the prophets and of God's holy people, and the blood of the people slaughtered all over the world. Chapter 19, after this, I heard what sounded like a vast crowd in heaven shouting, praise the Lord, salvation and glory and power belong to our God. His judgments are true and just. He has punished the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality, who has avenged the murder of his servants. And again, their voices rang out, praise the Lord, the smoke from them ascends forever and ever. Then the 24 elders and the four living beings fell down and worshiped God and sitting on the throne, they cried out, amen, praise the Lord. From the throne came a voice that that said, praise our God, all his servants who fear him from the least to the greatest. Then I heard again, what sounded like the shout of a vast crowd of her mighty roar of oceans, with waves crashes of loud thunder. Praise the Lord for the Lord our God, the mighty reign, the mighty, the almighty reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice. Let us give honor to him. For the time has come for the wedding feast of the lamb and his bride has prepared herself. She has been given the finest pure linen, white linen, for the fine linen represents the good deeds of God's holy people. And the angel said, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding feast of the lamb. And, and he added, these are the true words that come from God. And then I fell down at his feet to worship him. Then he said, no, don't worship me. I'm a servant of God, just like you and your brothers and sisters who testify about their faith in Jesus. Worship only God for the essence of prophecy is to give clear witness to Jesus. Then I saw the heaven open. This is the climax here, guys. Then I saw the heaven open and a white horse was standing there. Its rider was named Faithful and True, for he judges fairly and wages a righteous war. His eyes were like flames of fire and on his head were many crowns. A name was written on him that no one understood except himself. He wore a robe dripped in blood, I'm sorry, dipped in blood, and his title was the Word of God. The armies of heaven dressed in the finest pure white linen followed him on white horses. That's us, by the way. From his mouth came a sharp sword to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron rod. He will release the fierce wrath of God and Almighty like juice flowing from a wine press. On his robe at his thigh was written the title, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Then I saw an angel standing on the sun, shouting to the vultures flying in the sky, come gather together for the great banquet God has prepared. Come and eat the flesh of the kings and the generals and the strong warriors of horses and the riders and all humanity, both free, small and great. Then I saw the beast and the kings of the world and their armies gathered together to fight against the one standing on the horse and his army. One of the beasts was captured and give and with him the false prophet who did mighty miracles on behalf of the beast. Miracles that deceived the whole world who accepted the mark and worshiped a statue. Both the beast, who's the Antichrist, if you guys didn't know, and the false prophet were thrown in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. Their entire army was killed with a sharp sword and that came from the mouth of the one riding on the white horse and the vultures all gorged themselves on their dead bodies. Chapter 20. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven with the key to the bottomless pit and a heavy chain in his hand. He seized the dragon, the old serpent, who is the devil, Satan, and bound him in chains for a thousand years. The angel threw him into the bottomless pit, which then he shut and locked Satan so no one could, so he could not deceive the nations anymore until the thousand years were finished. Afterward, he will be released for a little while. Then I saw thrones and people sitting on them who had been given the authority to judge, and I saw souls of those who had been beheaded for their testimony about Jesus and proclaiming the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or a statue, nor accepted his mark on their foreheads or their hands. They all came to life again, that they um, and they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. This is the first resurrection. The rest of the dead did not come back to life until the thousand years had ended. Blessed and holy are those who share the first resurrection. For them, the second death holds no power. They will be priests and God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. 
When the thousand years had come to an end, Satan will be let out of his prison. He will go out to deceive the nations called Gog and Magog. In every corner of the earth, he will gather them together for battle, a mighty army as numerous, numberless as sands along the seashore. And I saw as they went up on the broad plain on the earth and surrounded God's people on the beloved city, but fire from heaven came down, attacking the armies and consumed them. Then the devil who had deceived them was thrown in the fire lake of burning sulfur, joining the beast and the false prophet, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. That is a good verse to memorize. And then I saw a great white throne and, a ju- and one sitting on it. The earth and sky fled from his presence, but they found no place to hide. Then I saw the dead, both great and small, standing before God's throne, and books were opened, including the book of life, and the dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. The sea gave up its dead, and death and the grave gave up their dead, and all were judged according to their deeds. Then death and the grave were thrown in the lake of fire. This lake of fire is the second death, and anyone whose name was not recorded in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Chapter 21. We are at like the five yard line here. Then I saw a heaven and a new then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared. Then the sea was also gone, and saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from heaven out of heaven like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, Look, God's home is now among his people. We live with him, and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. And the one sitting on the throne said, Look, I'm making everything new. And then he said to me, Write this down, for I tell you this is trustworthy and true. And he also said, It is finished. I am the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the end. To all who are thirsty, I will give freely the springs of water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit these blessings, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. But cowards unbelievers, the corrupt, murderers, the the immoral, those who practice witchcraft, idol worshipers, and liars, their fate in the, will have their fate in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Then one of the seven angels who held the seven bowls containing the seven last plagues came and said, come with me, I'll show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. So he took me in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God and sparkled like a precious stone, like a jasper as clear as crystal. The city wall was, uh, someone said, I just woke up from seven hours of sleep. Are you still going? Yes, Daisy, we are. <laughs> it shone the glory of God. <laughs> the city was, the city wall was broad and high with 12 gates guarded by 12 angels and the names of the 12 tribes of Israel were written on the gates. There were three gates on each side, east, north, south, and west. The wall of the city had 12 foundations of stones and on them were written the names of the 12 apostles of the lamb. The angel, imagine someone just slept for eight hours and I'm here still reading. The angel who talked to me held in his hand gold measuring stick to measure the city, its gates and its walls. Then he measured it. He found it was a square as wide as it was and long. In fact, the length, I think my lips bleeding. The, the length and the width and the height were each 1400 miles. And it's describing the new Jerusalem. Then he measured the walls and found to be them to be 216 feet thick. The wall was made of jasper and the city was pure gold, as clear as glass. The wall of the city was built on a foundation of stones inlaid with precious stones. The first was jasper, second sapphire, third agate, fourth emerald, fifth onyx, sixth carnelian, seventh um, chrysolite, the eighth beryl, and the ninth topaz, the tenth um, chiropes, and the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. The twelve gates were made of twelve pearl, were made of pearls, each gate from a single pearl, and the main gate of the street was pure gold and as and clear as glass. I saw no temples in the city, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. And the su- city needs no and the city needs no sun or moon, for the glory of the Lord illuminates the city, and the Lamb is its light. The nations will walk in its light, and the kings of the world will enter in the city in all their glory. The gates will never be closed day and night. There's no night. Uh, there will never be closed at the end of the day because there's no night there. And all the nations will bring their glory and honor into the city. Nothing evil will be allowed to enter. No anyone who practices shameful idolatry and dishonesty, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Then the angel showed me a river with the water of life, crystal clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and the lamb of God. It flowed down from the center of the main street on each side of the river grew trees bearing 12 crops of fruit with a fresh crop each month. The leaves were used for medicine to heal the nations. No longer will there be a curse upon anything for the throne of God and the lamb of God will be there and his servants will worship him. Then they will see his face and his name will be written on their foreheads and there will be no night there, no need for lamps or sun and the the Lord God will shine on them and they will reign for him forever and ever. Then the angel said to me, everything you have heard and seen is trustworthy. Save your comments, guys, because I'm almost done and I'm going to hang out and read the chat for a few for, for a bit here, okay? Then the angel said to me, everything you have heard and seen is trustworthy and true. The Lord who inspires his prophets sent his angels to tell his servants what will happen soon. Look, I'm coming soon. Blessed are those 
who obeyed the words of the prophecy written in this book. I, John, am the one who heard and saw all these things. And when I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel. But he said, no, don't worship me. I'm the servant of God, just like you and your brothers, um, the prophets, as well as those who obey what is written in this book. Only worship God, worship God only. Then he instructed me, do not seal up the prophetic words in this book for the time is near. Let the one who is doing harm continue to do harm, but let the one who is vile continue to be vile. Let the one who is righteous continue to live righteous. Let the one who is holy continue to be holy. Look, I am coming soon, bringing my reward with me to repay all according to their deeds. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash the robes. They will be permitted to enter through the gates of the city and eat from the fruits of the tree of life. Outside the city are the dogs the sorcerers, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idol, idol worshipers, and those who love to live a lie. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to you to give you this message for the churches. I, both the source of David and their heirs to this throne, I'm bright. I'm the bright and morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come. Here we are, guys. We're at the last end, 10 hours and 17 minutes. The spirit and the bride say, come. Let anyone who hears this say, come. Let anyone who is thirsty, come. Let anyone who desires drink freely, from the waters of life and i so solemnly declare to everyone who hears the words of prophecy written in this book if anyone needs anything to what is written here if anyone adds anything to what is written here god will add to that person the plagues described in this book and if anyone removes any of the words from this book of this prophecy god will remove that person from from sh their share of the tree of life and the holy city that are described in this book he who is faithful to wit and who come on can't can't mess up now he who is the faithful witness to all these things says, yes, I'm coming soon. Amen. Come Lord Jesus. May the grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's holy people. And there it is, guys. We are done. Let's get some party emojis, flame emojis, something emojis. We did it. 10 hours and 18 minutes reading out loud with two 10 minute breaks. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Amen. We are done. The chat goes wild. Thank you, Lord. 10 hours and 18 minutes. It's been amazing. We started at 11 a.m. and it is now 9.24 p.m. We are done with the New Testament out loud in one sitting with two 10-minute breaks. Praise the Lord. Look at the chat. The chat is going crazy. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> Praise the Lord. We did it, guys. Thank you, Lord. I'm so happy right now. Praise the Lord. Awesome. Awesome. 10 hours and 18 minutes to finish. Let me see if I can stop the timer here. I don't want to reset it, but let me just stop it. There we go. 10 hours, 19 minutes and nine seconds. We're stopping the timer. Oh man, let me stretch. To be honest, guys, I thought I was gonna, <laughs> I thought I was gonna finish in six hours. I'm not lying. I was like, I'm gonna get this done in six hours. I'm gonna read fast. We are done 10 hours and 19 minutes. I cannot believe it. We stood for about 60% of the time. I don't know. We stood for at least five hours, though. Thank you, Lord. Look at the chat. Awesome. Awesome, guys. We are done. Wow. That's crazy. Oh, man. That's a long time to read. My, vo my voice is actually not gone, surprisingly. Thank you, the, those that stayed the whole time. I know a lot of you did. There's 2,000, 2,100 people on right now. So I know a lot of you did. Thank you, Lord. My lip is, I'm pretty sure my lip is bleeding from my braces. Some little battle wounds here from reading for 10 hours. Thank you guys. Thank you guys. I appreciate you. Praise the Lord. Yeah, it, it's bleeding just a little bit, but it's not bad. It'll be fine. We'll survive. Paul, we already heard was beat and stoned and shipwrecked and killed and all that. So a little bit of blood in my lip is fine. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Oh man, my eyeballs. That's crazy, guys. I never thought I could read out loud for 10 hours straight. That's pretty crazy. Okay. Well, praise the Lord. Now I'm reading your comments. Yes, I hope that gets you guys excited about the Bible. Again, if one person finds this video and gets excited to read, then it's all worth it, honestly. So cool. Those of you jumping on to see if I made it, we made it. <laughs> Some of you went to bed and woke up the next day and I'm still on. Some of you went to work and eight hours later, I'm still on. So thanks for everyone's support. Thank you to everyone that gave. The, the links to give are in the chat. If you guys want to give, you can. We did it, guys. Yes. Yes. There's a bigger screen there. Um, here's the links to those of you that are asking. Is that going to move? Oh, no. That's going to mess up if I move it. Oh, well. The links to give are there if you want to. You don't have to. It is what it is. If you want a monthly partner, you can. It's all there. 
those of you that did okay here's the thing guys i usually every stream i read all the donations after um but guys i really don't want to read i'm sorry i really don't want to read all the donations i hope you guys don't mind but i really just don't want to read all the donations i've read so much my brain hurts my head is pounding I don't want to read all the donations, but if you do give, I appreciate you. I'll read them off stream because I know a lot of you gave with long messages and I'll read all of them off stream. Again, we were live for, we've been live for 10 hours and 19 minutes. So I see all the donations. I appreciate every single one of them, all the monthly partner signups. I'll email you guys tonight when I get off. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys. I appreciate you. I will read all of them after I promise. I'm just like, I'm just very, very, very tired so yeah we're not we're not reading the donations tonight but yeah man it's been awesome awesome let me move my little timer here because it's right there in the way of the code there we go we'll just put it there thank you jesus for giving me the strength i'm just gonna hang out for a couple minutes while i load up those of you that want to give at the end you can again no pressure um <laughs> my brain's kind of fried right now but yeah let me read let me read some of your guys' comments here. Someone said unsubscribing from Netflix and subscribing to Isaiah's monthly partner. Thank you, bro. I appreciate you. Awesome. Surprisingly, my body is sore. I, I don't know why. Just from standing, I think, for like five hours, I think. I don't know. Yeah, I haven't seen my wife and kids all day. I've been in here for 10 hours, so... The kids are already in bed, but yeah, I want to get off here soon. I just want to read a little bit of the comments here because I haven't been able to read comments all day. It's been killing me to see all your guys' comments and not been able to read them. So. Oh, man. Yeah, I think my back's just sore from, sore from standing up and moving around and staring at a screen and keeping my head in one spot. I've been a monthly partner for over a year. Thank you, Alita. I appreciate you. Why is our viewers not popped up here? Is this not working? I could probably fix it. There it is. Oh, wait a minute. What is going on here? There it goes. All right, there we go. We ended with 2100, which is awesome. We got 1800 now. Thank you guys for being here. It's humbling. I appreciate it. Thank you. It's 4 a.m., 30 a.m. in Senegal. Oh, I'm glad you're still here. I love you all. I appreciate you all. Someone said I'm tired from listening. I can't imagine actually reading. <laughs> the Old Testament, I think the book of Psalms takes five hours by itself. So I probably won't do the Old Testament. I've been here for the whole thing. Thank you, light child. I appreciate you. Thank you to everyone that's giving right now. Again, I'll read it off stream. My lip is, is raw from these braces. We did it. We did it. We did it. Yeah, reading in your head is much, 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 much easier. Way easier. Any headache? Yes, my head is throbbing. I think I just have a headache from staring at a screen for 10 hours and then the lights. I have lights on. I put the lights real low and I changed my camera settings so I wasn't blasting myself with light the whole time. But, yeah. I hope it encourages you guys. I really do. Um... I hope it encourages you guys to read the Bible, to get excited about the word, to challenge yourself to grow. If anything, if it does that, it's worth it. So cool. I always wondered if I could do this and I'm glad we were able to do this tonight. Thank you, Zamani. I appreciate you. Did you just read through or actually, or actually think? I read through out loud. Yeah, I read out loud for 10, out, for 10 hours. It took 10 hours and, and 20 minutes and 19 minutes to finish. I'm glad you guys had a good time. So did I. You read so good and strong. It's dumb. <laughs> Thanks, dude. I was like, who would make that comment? Thank you, dude. I appreciate you. I know a lot of people read too or just listen. So that's cool. I just realized you do this. I logged on at the end. Yeah, we're done. We are done. We've been live for ten over 10 hours. 10 hours and probably like 30 minutes now. We had to put it into two streams. The other one's on the page. It's eight hours. And then we had to stop and, and do a new stream. So 
You want to see the old one? You can see it. I know Romans. Woo, Romans was so good. I think that's probably going to be our next book. Either John or Romans will be our next book we go over. Romans was so good. I struggled with Hebrews. It was, it was, it was a struggle for me, but Romans was so, so good. So good. Romans was like, whoo. Paul was smacking up everybody in Romans. I was getting smacked up while reading it. Yeah, make sure you like the video. This is a new video, guys, so you do have to like it again if you haven't. It does help. But yeah, this is a brand new video. I don't know what the... Yeah, the thumbnail didn't even work for it. Oh, well. Yeah, the other video has 30,000 views because that's the amount of people that came in and out, which is cool. But yeah, this is a new video, so you do have to like it again if you, if you haven't. It helps. Romans is so good. Yeah. Romans got me rethinking my entire outlook. A lot of the stuff I read today, guys, of course, you've read it. I've read the New Testament so many times, but you always see something new, learn something new. And Romans, man, was so good. I felt like some of those stuff, I was like, I've never even, felt like I've never even read this, even though I know I have, but it's just that new revelation God speaks to you. Awesome. All right. I'm just reading some of the comments here because I haven't read any comments really today. My mom said Romans is my favorite. I agree, mom. So good. I, I would say now my favorite books are Revelation 1. Revelation is my first, is my number one favorite. Then John, then Romans. I logged in at Revelation chapter 16, but kudos to you. You came on. Yeah, at the very end there. Thanks for being here though. I encourage everybody to try this. Flaming Hot Mountain Dew. I haven't tried it. I really want to, though. Mm -mm. I don't remember Paul smacking anybody. I'm talking about, like, rebuking, rebuke-wise. Like, getting smacked with, like, conviction and rebuke. How hot is your my camera is on fire. I I honestly don't know how. You can't even touch it. I don't know how it's still even on right now. And my computer is basically probably putting out the same heat that the furnace that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego survived in. Literally, it's putting out so much heat right now. Just from being just from running the stream. Anytime you use slang, people are gonna get mad. It's all good. Where's your explaining of revelations on my channel? Go to my channel playlist and go to the book of Revelation. I have every single verse in Revelation. There's like 12 videos, I think. Um, they're like two hours each and they go through the ver you know, the verses. It's just on, go to playlist on my channel. That's the best place to find my content because I have so many videos, but it's just called the book of Revelation. Yeah, you can't even, I mean, my camera's hot to the touch. It's pretty crazy how it's still running right now. Thank you to everyone giving. I appreciate you guys. Thank you, thank you, thank you guys. I appreciate you. Thank you, Devin and Undra. Appreciate you guys. Oh, my eyeballs. Thank you, Alexandra. She just she just put the Book of Revelation playlist. Thank you. Jesus is smiling so hard right now. Thank you, Sergio. I hope so. Yeah, I got braces for a few months on my bottom teeth. And yeah, they're they're pretty straight now. They're like right there. I think I have like one more month and I'm getting them off. But I've had them for about two months now. Because I had Invisalign for two years and then the whole thing. Anyways, you'll sleep good tonight? Yes. All right, guys. I'm going to go <laughs> go to the out of my office and get some breathing fresh air i love you guys thank you for being here i honestly cannot believe I, I i'm not gonna lie i thought i even told my wife i said what about like an hour i'm not able to keep going or like 30 minutes and so i thought that that was possible we weren't going to do this so i'm glad we did i love you guys appreciate you guys love the support oh couple announcements i am taking off next week the last time i tried to take a vacation i ended up getting hurt and didn't even take a vacation so next week I am taking the week off Monday through Friday. I will not be uploading. I will not be posting. I will not be thinking about content. I will not be preparing content. I will not be making videos. I will be in the word, in prayer with my family, reading some books I've been wanting to read and just relaxing and not even thinking about creating content. Okay. So next week 
I will be off completely. I will not be thinking about making content. I'm gonna be taking the whole week off because I need to. I, I tried taking a week off a few weeks ago and ended up getting hurt in my neck and didn't end up getting a week off. I just ended up in pain for days. And it's been, this week has been super, super crazy. Monday stream, Tuesday stream, Wednesday I preached. Thursday I had a partner's call. Friday I had stuff getting ready for this stream. Today I had stream all day. Tomorrow's Mother's Day. So I'm taking next week off. No uploads. I might have short form because it's just going to be edited and posted by my brother, but I will not be editing. I will not be doing anything related to content. So that will be next week. We'll be Discord will be up all that. I'll probably jump in there and stuff like that. But I will be brain. My brain will be turned off from thinking about having to create content and make stuff and get this and do that and create that and blah, blah, blah. So that'll be next week. But then on Saturday and Sunday, I will be in Texas. And the info's on my website if you want to register for Texas. Me and Daniel Adams, we have over 3,000 registered already. So get registered on my website if you want to see me in Texas. And then May 22nd, I'll be preaching at Lifesong Church in Stockton, California for services. So I need to put that on my website. But I will be at Lifesong May 22nd for four services. And then next weekend, I will be in Texas. So... If you want to see me in Texas, it'll be the only time I'm there this this year. Go to my website and find all the info and register. Doors open at 2 o'clock on Saturday and 9.30 on Sunday. Robstown, Texas, okay? So, again, we have over 3,000 registered already. It's going to be massive. It's going to be great. It's warriors of deliverance. It's going to be... God's going to move. It's going to be powerful. I love you guys so much. I appreciate you guys. I will see you guys in Texas or I will be live next Monday. I will be off here for a week. What's today? Saturday? So yeah, I'll be off here for a week. I will not be posting anything. No uploads, no content for the week. You have plenty of content you can catch up on. I have 720 videos on the channel. So there's no lack of content there. You could go find something to watch. But I do love you guys. I do appreciate you guys. And I will see you guys then. Happy Mother's Day to all you mothers out there. We love you. We appreciate you. Happy Mother's Day to my mom. And I'll see her tomorrow. But I just want to say happy Mother's Day to my wife, to everybody watching that as a mother. You are legends. You are amazing. Um, happy Mother's Day to you. Thank God for you. Okay. Well, there it is. 10 hours and 20 minutes. We finished. Love you guys. See ya. Or maybe not because I can't even find. There it is. Love you guys. Have a good night. See ya. Thanks for being here. Thank you everyone that donated that monthly partner to all that. I really appreciate it. Thank you guys that stayed the whole time. You guys are amazing. You guys were praying for me and cheering me on. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Love you guys. Appreciate you. Really, really appreciate all the moderators. Alexandria, thank you so much for always holding it down. All the mods, everybody. You guys are amazing. All right. See you guys. You don't have to register, but I highly recommend it. It's free. It's a free event. But if you could register, please do so we have a head count. Good night. Love you guys.